So we have the Department of Revenues here to join us and talk about prop or uh, not property taxes. You want to talk about property taxes again? Sure. Come on, encore, encore. How about sales tax? Let's talk sales tax and then some tax administration issues that you may be having. And uh, Director Henson, the floor is yours. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Members of the committee, Brenda Henson, Director of the Department of Revenue. Thank you again for this opportunity to provide some uh, information related to the administration of our sales and use tax statutes. Uh, we've included a, a PowerPoint presentation uh, and it truly is intended to be a reference document for future use. Um, I have today with me, Brett Fanning, the administrator of the Excise Tax Division, uh, and uh, he will go over many of the slides, but those that are just referencing current statute will move through those fairly quickly. So um, just wanted to assure you that hopefully this won't take three hours. Mm -hmm. uh, but I wanna start off by uh, reading something. I uh, found this interesting. So within the Department of Revenue, uh, this document, uh, the rules and regulations relating to the Emergency Sales Tax Act of 1935 going to go to the first page and read the purpose. The primary purpose of the act. This act is to be in effect for the period of two years, April 1, 1935 to March 31st, 1937. The act has for its primary purpose, the relief of property tax. So Mr. Chairman, just a little bit of property tax discussion today, but just uh, knowing that um, you know, sales tax, that was its early purpose, was to try and, and relieve some of the burden related to property tax. So, um, Mr. Chairman, with that, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Brett Fanning. Uh, as many of you know, he has been with the agency a little over a year. Uh, his background is extensive, uh, spending over a decade in the Department of Audit doing um, fuel tax audits, sales tax audits, tobacco tax. So uh, he brings uh, a great deal of knowledge from both sides of the functionality of our statutes and where um, it, when he would go out and work with uh, retailers and vendors, their questions on how confusing our statutes are, um, keeping in mind that we administer the law, but we're a self-reporting state. So you stop and think about it every retailer is having to make that decision of what is a taxable event, what should they be collecting and remitting the correct amount. Um, so we look at it as the Department of Revenue and the vendors are a team in that the consumer is the purchaser, the entities that rely on those sales tax dollars to provide services are where that money goes to in the end. So the Department of Revenue and the vendors, retailers, we're really working on this jointly and want to make sure that that communication is always uh, trying to make that easy for the uh, retailers and vendors. So with that, Mr. Fanning. Mr. Fanning, welcome. And I just want to take this moment to thank you for, for both you and Director Henson for what you guys do at Department of Revenue. You make our jobs a lot easier because you, you know the tax code inside and out. And uh, your expertise is very helpful and useful for us. And we appreciate what you guys do. And with that, please introduce yourself and go through your presentation. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. So Mr. Chairman, Mr. Co-Chairman, members of the committee, Brett Fanning, I'm the Excise Tax Administrator here at the Wyoming Department of Revenue. So thank you so much for this opportunity, truly for us to uh, provide some guidance, some education related to sales tax. As we've been discussing for the past few days, these taxation issues are hard and they're very difficult. And yesterday we had a very good discussion about property tax and I'm learning a ton as well, right? And so we've got 23 different counties. We've got the department and a couple boards trying to administer property tax here in the state of Wyoming. For sales tax, I'm tasked with administering 47,000 plus, trying to navigate this tax code that the state of Wyoming has. Now, again, it just, uh, that's why we're here is to provide education to see if there are ways um, 
for, for clarification, again, we're not trying to provide any guidance on what's taxable or what's not. That is not our job. For us, it's just trying to make it uh, clear and concise and consistent for the taxpayers and the vendors and the constituents of the state of Wyoming. So with that, Mr. Chairman, I'll proceed with PowerPoint. And again, I, I do understand time is of the essence. So thank you, thank you. So just a little bit of background. And again, uh, just sales tax, okay, what is it? It is this transactional tax on consumption. And so this is a little bit different than the taxes we've been talking about. There is uh, this perception that with a sales tax, it being transactional, you, you have some, if you don't wanna be taxed, maybe you don't buy as, enough, uh, buy as much. And that is kind of an impression that you get with sales tax. Now that doesn't always work, but if you don't want to pay sales tax on, say, a new car or new clothing, uh, you wouldn't have to if you don't purchase those products, right? And so that's kind of the, the thought process behind what sales tax is. It's a tax on consumption. As you can see, the vast majority of states do have a sales tax, but it varies differently throughout the country. I mean, it really, truly does. As Director Henson mentioned, uh, Ours dates back to the 1930s. At that time, it was 2%. It's been raised a couple of times since then. It's now 4% at the state level. And while I have the opportunity on the slide, Mr. Co-Chairman had asked me to do a little bit of homework. You can see on the map here that uh, the state of Wyoming does have basically the lowest sales tax rate in the country. Okay, And we, we've heard throughout the past couple of days that the state of Wyoming does have one of the lowest tax burdens in the country. But Mr. Co-Chairman asked me to, he asked me a really good question. I'd never really thought of it this way. It was kind of what's an effective tax rate that you have? So if we're comparing one state to another, what, what's the difference in the tax rate? And it, and had asked me generally to um, compare it with a state to the northeast of us, basically just to the east of us now, um, because there's a regional proximity, right? There's kind of a similar population. There's some tribal considerations. There's an international destination like Wyoming has. And so essentially the state to the east of us is what Wyoming would look like without minerals. Right. And so that's why a lot of comparisons come this way. So, Mr. Co chairman, I was doing some research and uh, came across a variety of sources. And, and it is a little difficult to just sales tax burden effective tax rate. But I did come across a couple sources where, say, per 100,000 of income for a resident, the state of Wyoming sales tax, you're going to pay about $22. The state to the east is going to pay $33. I found another couple resources that compared rates. Uh, the state of Wyoming, about 3% on $1,000 of income, and another state to us, uh, about 4%. So in general, the effective tax rate based on my research on comparing a state to the east of us is about a 1% difference. And that was kind of something that we'd mentioned. That's because the state to the east really taxes a lot more things than we do, right? And directly to the east. So that that gap generally in Wyoming, as we've learned, is, is um, filled by the mineral industry. So um, just, just some homework that I tried to do just to kind of see, as opposed to I can see the rates lower, how does that compare to other states in the region? Mr. Fanning, for those that are geographically challenged, uh, the state you're referring to is South Dakota, correctly? correct? Mr. Chairman, that's correct. I just wanted to make sure I followed all the rules sure. as opposed no, we, to. Uh, uh, no, you can. Yes. We don't have those rules here. You can you can use state proper names and we're pretty lax around here. So. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Again, didn't want to. Okay, so again, with, with a sales tax, there's also a complementary use tax as well. So if something is sales taxable in Wyoming, it is also use taxable. And what that means is that generally up until a few years ago, if you purchase something from online or out of state, brought it into Wyoming for storage use or consumption, tax was due on it. What was happening though is that use tax is a self-reported tax. 
So if you purchase something from online, from a big online retailer, uh, and didn't pay tax, that didn't mean tax wasn't due. It just meant you had to self-report it. But by a show of hands, how many folks self-reported it, right? And so that was kind of the dilemma with use tax. But use tax is also not a new tax. It dates back to the 1930s as well. And so taxpayers have got to know what's taxable, and they've got to for lack of a better term, charge themselves tax. And I, I have some slides later on down the road where this has really completely changed uh, here in the state of Wyoming and really throughout the country. Uh, the state of Wyoming, if you do pay tax to another state, okay, sales tax to another state, we say you no longer have a liability here in the state of Wyoming as long as it's equal to or greater than the tax that's due in your county. So if you've gone to the state of South Dakota and paid 7% tax, if you bring it anywhere, for the most part in the state of Wyoming, there's no additional tax due. Okay. Moving on to the next slide, uh, I, I did include our current sales tax rates, again, in, in the um, essence of time. Uh, as you can see, the, the colored in lines here are all the tax rates that for lack of a better term, changed April 1, 2023. And a lot of the lines are really geared towards the statewide lodging assessment kicking in. And if you remember, a few years ago, the state of Wyoming implemented a statewide lodging tax, and then it capped the actual local tax that uh, our counties could charge their residents. Well, in doing that, a lot of the tax rates changed, but it was just really a distribution portion of it. And the ones that did not have a change, lodging tax has not been on the ballot yet. So it, in the state of Wyoming for sales tax, you're generally going to pay between 4 and 6%, right? There are two counties that have 4%. Uh, the vast majority... 21 out of 23 have a 5% at least tax rate. And then we have several that have 6% as well. As you can see, um, generally considered fifth and sixth penny taxes. And then we do have two counties that have instituted the economic development tax. But generally in the state of Wyoming, four to 6% sales tax rate, uh, not including lodging. Okay. Move on to slide six right here. I did want to talk about sales tax distribution just briefly. And, and uh, Mr. Chairman, if I could ask Director Henson just a quick clarification. So yesterday we, we did have a property tax discussion. And so Director Henson, outside of kind of education, what percentage of property tax actually comes to the state of Wyoming to, for, to pay for state services? Director Hansen. Um, <clears throat> so there are zero property tax dollars that are deposited <clears throat> into the state general fund. We do have the 12 mills for the school foundation, but that would be the only monies that go from for property tax dollars. Okay. Mr. Panning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Director Hansen. So again, piggyback in this discussion. Sales tax is really one of the stools that Wyoming uses for its tax revenue and to fund a lot of the services that we're talking about. So you've you've basically got two components here. The first part is this four-part sales tax or this 4% sales tax. So of that 4%, roughly 69% is going to come to the state. Okay. The state of Wyoming gives roughly 30% of that to the local counties, for the most part, the local share. Out of the local share section of it, the state of Wyoming doesn't get anything, right? And that is all based on voter approval. So the slides, uh, the local share section, the second part on the right of my slide, uh, it's all at the local level. I, in previous roles with the state of Wyoming, traveled throughout the country, um, some states say we're very generous to our locals, and some states say you're not generous enough. And so, again, that's just a conversation that's out there. It, but the state of Wyoming gets 4%. When I do my um, 
70 percent ish of the four percent when i generally do my fiscal notes for lso um, taking an average sales tax rate, I generally say the state of Wyoming gets 52% of the average sales tax rate. So when you, you go to a restaurant, you know, I just went to Taco John's for lunch. Uh, basically, the state is going to get half of the tax on my lunch, 52% versus 48% that's going to come here to areas in Sheridan County. Just wanted to highlight our sales tax distribution. Here you can see uh, total sales tax that went to the state and to the local share. You're looking at 1.1 billion. And, and I'm rounding not just because um, every taxpayer dollar is sacred. Everyone here understands that, but 1.1 billion. Now there, there was a conversation that had come up yesterday about, oh, somehow raising the sales tax rate by a percentage or decreasing it by percentage, taxing more, that, that's come up. What would be the estimate there? And so what I'm going to do is just circle this figure right here. Uh, it's hard to see. It's $171 million, and that's the fifth penny allocation. Because remember, we've got 21 out of 23 counties that have a fifth penny, but the state doesn't get all of that share, right? If you were to allocate it here, uh, there's a distribution formula that's, that comes into play here. But the fifth penny collected $171 million. Now, what portion would the state get versus the local portion if you were to increase the sales tax rate? That's clearly a policy decision. But that is a figure that's right here in our distribution. Um, it takes a little calculation to get a little more exact figure, but that was just uh, – run of the math when I was sitting behind listening to some of the conversation. On slide eight, just wanted to talk about the sales tax distribution. So the first, the top portion of it is sales tax, the bottom portion is use tax. So as you can see, they generally flow together, the state portion versus the local share, just because if something's taxable in one county, it's taxable in all counties. And so they're generally going to flow together. If you look at the use tax distribution, th this is something that that's really stands out, at least to me. You can see how you have this really big decrease. A lot of folks say that this de decrease is based on the passage of our remote seller and marketplace facilitator language which meant that online sales, you had to start collecting sales tax if you met certain thresholds. That's the amount of sales tax, or sorry, sales and use tax that was not being collected in previous years. And it's really stark. It really is. Now, if you're looking at the graph, you're like, okay, well, why didn't our sales tax collections go up? And that question's a little more complicated because you've got mineral industry, uh, you've got maybe some erosion of the sales tax base, maybe as something the co-chairman's mentioned several times, service industries are changing. So you've got a lot of different factors in play as to why the sales tax uh, remains a little more flat than maybe the use tax. And it's all based on passage, at least in the use tax section in 2019. Mr. Fanning, um, would it be fair to say that the use tax, the people that primarily pay the use tax would be industry. Would that be a fair assumption? Because most people don't even know they owe, like being here in Sheridan, right next to Montana, where there's no sales tax, we all go shopping at Costco and pay, get our stuff up there because we save on sales tax. Most people don't know they owe use tax. So it would be fair to say right? that the prim primary driver of the use tax would be the, the industry because they know they have to report and pay that and it's more susceptible to the boom bust cycle. Mr. Chairman, yes, well said. I did briefly wanna highlight, again, in the spirit of time, just what is sales taxable in the state of Wyoming? And, and this is important because uh, actually what is, I, I know there's a lot of conversation out there, but I did just briefly wanna highlight, so what is sales taxable in the state of Wyoming? Before I move on to that, um, we're going to go through a lot of information here. 
we do have chapter two rules to try and clarify some of these statutes that we have on the books. And we are actually in that process of trying to clarify these rules for everyone involved, the department, vendors, taxpayers, our constituents, and there are still a few days left in our public period if someone wants to see the progress that we've made on our rules to try and streamline those to help out the taxpayers of Wyoming. Okay, so the first one, th these are things that are taxable. And if something's taxable, then that means you have to license with the department and then start uh, you're a vendor with the state of Wyoming and then report your sales to us. So the first first thing, the sales price paid for every retail sale of tangible personal property. Okay, what's tangible personal property include? Really, it's anything perceivable to the senses, but I did want to highlight because there are some things we've talked about uh, throughout the past couple of days that have an impact here. Okay, electricity is considered tangible personal property. Water, gas, steam, software, those are the main highlights. So when we start talking about uh, electricity, okay, there is sales tax on it for the most part, other than when it's exported outside the state of Wyoming. The gross rental paid for the lease or contract of transferring tangible personal property if there was a sale that happened. Right, So you've got, if you sell tangible personal property or if you rent it, sales taxable. Next one, the sales price paid for intrastate telecommunications. So this is going to be something to remember going forward, intrastate. So inside the state of Wyoming, these things are taxable, telecommunications, intra. The sales price paid for carriers for intrastate transportation of passengers. What this generally is, taxi cabs, that, that sort of industry. If you're going to be transporting from Cheyenne, Wyoming to Sheridan, Wyoming, that's a taxable event, intra. Next one, sales price paid to public utilities and per persons furnishing gas, electricity, or heat for domestic, industrial, or commercial consumption. So again, this is another statute that we have in our books where the retail sale of tangible personal property, taxable, but then we've also got clarification that says, hey, if you're going to uh, pay a public utility for certain utilities, those are taxable as well. Next one, F, the sales price paid for meals and cover charges, excluding gratuities, regardless of whether offered by the customer or invoiced by the seller at any place where meals are regularly sold to the public, served to the public. And the reason that I went through that entire definition is I do have a talking point later on um, that meals served regularly to the public is an important distinction here. Okay, so if I go and buy a meal at a restaurant, generally sales taxable. Moving on, the sales price paid for living quarters and hotels, motels, and similar services to transient guests. So if I stay at a hotel, that's taxable. Next one, H, the sales price paid for the admission to any place of amusement, entertainment, recreation, games, or athletic events. Okay, so if I go to a concert, sales taxable. Moving on to J, the sales price paid for services performed for the repair, alteration, or improvement of tangible personal property. Now, once upon a time, I always told our taxpayers that, hey, if uh, you're working on tangible personal property, that's sales taxable. This has changed due to recent uh, litigation that we've had. And it's actually one of the tax administration uh, questions that we have going forward. Uh, we we had had someone who offered roadside services question if the repair, alteration, or improvement of tangible personal property qualified to be taxable in the state of Wyoming. Um, there were wins and losses on both sides. Ultimately, the Supreme Court said, hey, we're not quite sure if um, changing a tire on the side of the road or jump-starting a vehicle or uh, – you lock your keys out of the vehicle if that's a repair, alteration, or improvement. And, and, and so that, that's a discussion that's probably worth having because we don't know how far 
that actually goes. And, and just clarification either way, that's all the department is requesting with that tax administration portion. Okay, uh, K, you'll hear me call that special K if you ever call into my office. So generally, uh, any oil filled services during the production casing phase are sales taxable. And okay, that's a big imposition statute as well. I won't spare you reading through all that language. Next slide, I'm on, number, on slide 12. Sales price paid for motor vehicles, house trailers, basically anything that needs to be titled, sales taxable. Sales price paid for alcoholic beverages. The sales price paid for computer hardware. Okay. And then P, the sales price paid for every retail sale of specified digital products. It's important to note this includes digital products for permanent use. That's also a tax administration portion that we have as well. So those, those are our imposition statutes, right? I, I believe there's 14 of them. They correlate into dozens of different services, but those are the things that are sales taxable here in the state of Wyoming. So if you or your business does any one of those items, you've got a license with the department and collect sales tax for the state of Wyoming and then the local jurisdictions. So again, I, I highlighted a picture here at downtown Sheridan. A, a vendor is any person engaged in the business of just selling these taxable items. So if you do it, uh, you got a license with us, and it really is this trust relationship between the state of Wyoming and the taxpayer. Right, The department's just in the middle of this redistributing money. But when you're a vendor, there is this trust relationship that you're going to collect the taxes on my behalf and then send it into the department. That's the relationship that you have here in sales tax. Now, it, it is, remember, sales tax is reported to us on a, on a good, faith base, good faith basis. So we're ensuring or we're entrusting you that you're going to send in the taxes to me on my behalf. And that's the way the vast majority of states do work as well. It is a trust tax. Sales tax um, generally do based on where the customer receives the product. And I did highlight here just a picture of downtown Sheridan, right? Because that's where we are. And in this picture, you've got a hotel, you've got a restaurant, you've got a credit union, you've got a bank. Pawn shop, fireplace repair, antique store, package liquor, law office, bakery, clothing store, coffee shop, and a photography store. That gives me serious anxiety because each one of those has different taxing consequences. And, and that's the reason I highlighted this. And it's really difficult sometimes. Again, each one is really geared towards their own industry. But when, when I look at this, I'm like, that's hard. And, and it really is. A lot of the reasons it's hard are going to get into what we're going to discuss next, right? So we know what's taxable. What's not taxable here in Wyoming? Slide 14. Okay. There is an important difference between what's taxable. Let me rephrase that. Something that's not taxable and then an exemption. Something that's not taxable lacks an imposition statute, right? There, there's, there's nothing taxable there. An exemption is something that would be taxable, but for whatever reason, the legislature has said we're going to exempt it and shift the burden to other taxpayers here in the state of Wyoming. Again, just clarification there, no, nothing policy related whatsoever. So what are examples of things that lack imposition statutes here in the state of Wyoming. Really anything to real property. So buildings, land, if you're going to sell it, if you're going to rent it, if you're going to work on it, any service to live humans, animals, uh, anything. We don't consider those generally tangible personal property. Uh, user fees. So if I want to go and golf the Powderhorn here in Sheridan or do a, a ski lift ticket, in Jackson, generally those are considered user fees as opposed to places of admission or uh, amusement. 
professional services. And, and again, long list there, accountants, taxpayers, engineers, doctors, lawyers, all of these professional services. It is important to note, and, and it really did happen last session is, and it has been talked about over the past few days as well. So say the legislature wanted to include an imposition statute with whichever one of these industries, it's actually the end consumer right? Who's going to be paying these taxes. These industries would just become tax collectors, right? And so there is this distinction here. They're, they're not necessarily the ones paying the tax, right? They're the ones collecting it on behalf of everyone who uses these services and then sending it into the department. That is a distinction there. Now, an exemption is a little bit different, right? This is where I wasn't paying tax before. If you get rid of it, now I'm paying tax. But at the end of the day, I've really got to shift the burden to my customer too, right? Because a business has got to make money to stay in business. We've heard that for the past few days. So it is important to note. And then a lot of financial industry transactions, uh, getting a mortgage, in any of those big things, interest, financing, generally lack imposition statutes as well. Okay. Uh, Slide 15. So we know what's taxable. We know what's not taxable. What's exempt? Okay. So I am going to go through these. And, and again, just briefly. So what is exempt? So the first one, um, sales which the state of Wyoming is prohibited from taxing per federal law. Next one, interstate transportation of passengers. Okay. The federal government says we can't do that either. Next one, sales of railroad rolling stock, including locomotives purchased by railroads, aircraft purchased by interstate carriers, and big trucks, tractor trailers that are used in interstate commerce. So if you're buying a big truck or a big vehicle that's going to be moving across state lines and you're authorized to do, do so, federal government says you can't tax that. Uh, same thing with C at the bottom of page 16. If you're going to lease it, again, remember our statutes generally say a sale and a lease are pretty similar. If you're going to lease it as well uh, for interstate commerce, not tax. Sorry, exempted. Slide 17, D, sales to Wyoming joint apprenticeship or training programs as approved by the Department of Labor. E, sales of food purchased by food stamps. Okay, exempted. And uh, these exemptions, it's important to note, are per federal law. So the state of Wyoming has little wiggle room on what it would what it would like to do with those types of exemptions. So moving on, uh, then we get into our production exemptions. So sales of tangible personal property to the business engaged of manufacturing, processing, or compounding when it becomes an ingredient in that process. So the general thought here is, okay, we're gonna give you exemption on what you purchase. At the end of the day, when everything's manufactured, built, processed, you're gonna collect sales tax on the other side. Slide 18, sales of livestock, feeds for use in feeding livestock for marketing purposes and seeds, roots, bulbs, small plants and fertilizer applied to the land which are gonna be sold. Okay, so this is a big ag exemption where you can purchase a lot of those items without sales tax. And again, when I say a big ag, there's no, no intent there. There really isn't. It's just this applies to a lot of different products, and that is what it is. C, intrastate, so we're here inside of Wyoming, by public utility or others of raw farm products to manufacturing or processing plants. Okay, so remember, intrastate transportation was normally taxable. It's not for this specific use. Sales of power or fuel to the purchase and engage in the business of manufacturing. Remember, power is usually sales taxable, but if you're going to be producing something, no longer sales taxable. Slide 19, sales of power or fuel to a person engaged in the transportation business when the same is consumed directly in generating motive power for actual transportation purposes, except for highway fuel. 
what it, what did that say? And, and so based on that, we did have recent litigation on this one as well, where um, what exactly does in the transportation business mean? And so that's something that um, working its way through. Generally in the past, this was a locomotive or a pipeline exemption, right? And, and so now industry is really shifting to do a lot of different things. And so we're getting questions on that. Mr. Fanning, can I interrupt you real quick? Sure. Going back to uh, sale of power or fuel to a person engaged in the business of manufacturing, processing, or agriculture, um, I'm assuming that means electricity as well. So they're electric, they're, they're not paying sales tax on electricity where others are in this similar industries. Mr. Chairman, that's correct. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Still on slide 19 F wholesale sales. This, this is a major exemption. So generally, and, and I wouldn't even be able to come up with an estimate on this one. Generally you can purchase something without sales tax because you're going to resell it with sales tax. That's generally the wholesale exemption in the most basic terms. One of the most widely used exemptions that you're going to see in our books, because essentially every business is going to use this exemption because if they're selling tangible personal property, you have an exemption there. Uh, G sales of fuel for use as boiler fuel in the production of electricity. So Mr. Chairman, there are a couple other uh, exemptions here related to power in this in this industry. The cost of food or meals on slide 20 furnished by a food establishment without charge to an employee for consumption on the premises. So if you're a restaurant and you're trying to help out your employees, you're gonna you don't have to accrue tax on those meals that you're giving to your employees. So the next one, sales to the state of Wyoming or its political subdivisions. Okay, if you're going to sell the state of Wyoming, you don't need to collect sales tax. Sales made to religious or charitable organizations, including nonprofits working with senior citizens. Right. So if you're going to sell to a religious or charitable organization, you don't have to collect sales tax. Slide 21, occasional sales made by religious or charitable organizations for fundraising purposes uh, for the conduct of regular religious or charitable functions or activities. So if you're going to have a, uh, in our rules, we determine occasional sale is four or less than a year. So if you're going to have a bake sale once a year, you don't have to collect sales tax. This exemption is a little different. If you notice, I'm going to pop back to slide 20. So if you're going to sell to a religious organization, you don't have to collect sales tax. This one's a little different. This one's saying the religious doesn't have to collect sales tax to the public if they only do it a couple, couple times a year. So it's just a slight little distinction there I thought I'd point out. Sales to Joint Powers Board organized under the Wyoming Joint Powers Act. That came up yesterday as well. So if you're going to pool together joint boards and make a sale to them, you do not have to charge sales tax. Sales price to ad, of admission to and user fees for county or municipally owned recreation facilities, such as swimming pools, athletic facilities, rec centers. This is also one that comes up in our tax administration as well. So sales price to amusements, something owned by a local jurisdiction, not sales tax. Slide 22, labor or service charges, including transportation and travel for the repair, alteration, or improvement of real property or tangible personal property owned by or incorporated in projects under contract to the state of Wyoming or its political subdivisions. Okay, this is another one where uh, clarification is important because we have had recent litigation on it. Uh, we, we did have an oil field producer that said, hey, we're working on state lands, and all of that work should be sales tax exempt. When we were looking at the invoices, the transaction was actually between an oil field producer and a customer, not between the oil field producer and the state of Wyoming. 
And so we had recent litigation on that one as well, because the uh, owned by or incorporated projects under contract to the state of Wyoming, that, that part of the sentence really created a little bit of confusion. Sales to an irrigation district, sales to a weed and pest district, uh, J at the bottom of 22, intrastate trans of persons by a government, charitable, or nonprofit organization. Slide 23, sales of transportable homes after the sales tax has been paid once. This came up yesterday in some property tax discussion. So there is sales tax on it one time at 70% of the purchase price. C, sales of gasoline or gasohol taxed under our uh, YDOT statutes. This one's intriguing because if you think about it, if you were to go to the store and buy a can of tobacco or cigarettes, you would pay both sales tax and a tobacco tax would be incorporated in that price as well. Gasoline doesn't have that same exemption. Right, So if you buy fuel, if I go up and buy fuel here at the local convenience store, it's only fuel taxable. Uh, it is not sales taxable when you purchase gasoline at the local convenience store. And I know there have been, um, I do know states that charge sales tax on fuel. But fuel is really, it's really a fluid conversation. And people really understand when it goes up by a cent. Okay. Uh, gratuities or tips offered to tipped employees. Uh, again, that is one we could actually come up with a figure on the cost of that exemption. We could contact YDOT, see how many gallons of fuel was sold, take it by an average price, take it by a tax rate, and you could see. I'm not saying that we should do that. I'm just saying it could be done. Mr. Fanning, you you saw what happened yesterday with property taxes and the pitchforks and the, yeah, go ahead and put a sales tax on gasoline and see how that works out. For you. <laughs> Proceed. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I know I'm getting things thrown at thrown at me from behind, but uh, the next one on slide 24: intrastate transportation by public utility of others for sick, injured, or deceased. B. I'm going to read the majority of this. It's the sales of the following tangible personal property sold under a prescri prescription. Okay, so if you're going to have a prescription, generally that is not sales taxable, but it doesn't include over the counter drugs. Okay, and so we've got a term in there for assisted device, and then we've also got a term in our rules for mobility enhancing equipment. So if you've got a prescription, in many cases, not all though, uh, it would be sales tax exempt. Slide 25, sales of all non-capitalized equipment and disposable supplies which are used in the direct medical or dental care of a patient. So if you, generally, if you have a one-time use item, it's gonna be sales tax exempt in the medical field. Mr. Fanning, it looks like Senator McEwen has a question real quick. Real quick, I'm looking at this. Am I reading this right? Insulin is taxable? Mr. Fanning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Chairman, Senator McEwen, great question. Because, so if we read this, uh, drugs for human relief, excluding over-the-counter drugs. So, Drugs for human relief are exempt, but over-the-counter drugs are taxable. Then we hop back to what is exempted, insulin and any syringe needle, oxygen for medical use, blood pads, and then we continue onward. So generally, we're going to administer those as exempt. Okay, The comma there is a little, it can be a little confusing. And again, clarification is always welcomed. So back on slide 25, uh, sales of water delivered by truck or pipeline. Okay, remember water is considered tangible personal property, but depending on how you deliver it, could change it. Generally, the thought there is if I come down to E, 
is sales of food for domestic home consumption. So generally water delivered by pipeline or truck, um, there's a use factor there as opposed to, um, oh, I, I'm gonna leave it at that. I'm gonna leave that one at that. So let's go to E, sales of food for domestic home consumption. There's always a lot of talk about removing this exemption on food. And I've actually worked with the state of South Dakota because they are also looking at exempting food. Um, if there were push, and I'm not advocating one bit to get rid of the food exemption, what would still be non-taxable if you remove this exemption, right? And so if we, if we do a little bit of discussion here and come through some of my notes. So remember, you've got food stamp sales, which are not sales taxable per, per federal law. And then per our imposition statute for prepared food, uh, it doesn't include food at senior centers, hospitals, or schools. So you still have protections for your elderly, your sick, and your children, and the food stamp recipients. And that's also a discussion point that uh, comes up eventually as well. But just, just a point of discussion there. So still on slide 25. Interstate or intrastate transportation of drilling rigs. Um, on slide 26, a person regularly engaged in the business of making loans or a supervised financial institution that forecloses a lien or repossesses a motor vehicle. There's also, um, there's kind of an exemption outside of our exemption statutes that has very similar language, but also includes insurance companies. So the thought here, it, it, again, from what I can tell is that, hey, uh, these items were taken possession of inadvertently or not intentionally, and then the sale is going to be when you actually sell it to a consumer, an end consumer. So Economic incentive exemptions. This is also something that we talk about on slide 26 and our tax administration issues. So you've got intrastate transportation of employees to and from work when paid or contracted by the employer. You're going to see this a lot in the mineral industry. You see the coal trucks running up and down Highway 59. Generally, there's no sales tax on those items. I've also seen private jets used to fly and check oil fields, oil wells, right? This, this exemption does happen uh, pretty frequently. Intrastate transportation of freight and property. So generally, uh, any freight that you're going to see, the vast majority, not all, is not going to be uh, taxable. It's exempt. On slide 27, the sales of services of professional engineers and like occupations before the taxable phase in the oil field. So in the oil field, you have two phases. One, there's an exemption for the labor, and then the other one, it's taxable and pretty much everything's taxable in that well site. Okay, again, still in the economic exemption portion, we've got um, sales of school yearbooks, those are exempt. Uh, sales of newspapers, those are exempt. Moving on to 28, sales of carbon dioxide and other gases used in production. G, sales of lodging services provided by a person known to the trade or public as a guide for temporary structures. These individuals are exempt from the local portion of the lodge of the local portion of the lodging tax. And this is one um, still still working on education throughout this industry. H sales of farm implements. Okay, so farm implements means any tractor or machinery designed or adapted and used exclusively for ag operations and specifically excludes any titled vehicle, snowmobiles, lawn tractors, ATVs, and repair or replacement parts. Slide 29, the sale of aircraft repair, remodeling, or maintenance services at an FAA facility. 
sales of goods or services made for the purpose of raising money or charges for admission to basically any K through 12 event. O, uh, until December 31st, 2027, sale of manufacturing machinery, as long as you meet these two qualifications. This is also something that we have in our tax administration uh, issues. Slide 30, the sale or lease of any aircraft used in commercial aviation, right? Very similar to the one above, but just slightly different. R, the sale of equipment used to construct a new coal gasification or liquefaction facility. This is uh, one we've talked about, hoped it would be used a little more than it is currently today. 31. Uh, slide 31, sorry, uh, data processing center. Again, we, we do have a data processing center exemption as long as you meet certain criteria. And a lot of the criteria are, um, if, if you just look at the first part, it's over $2 million. After you've already pre-qualified, it's actually $2 million as long as you make over $2 million in equipment purchases, you can qualify to purchase those exempt. And if you spend over $2 million a year, as long as you've met other criteria for power supplies, there's also an exemption there. Slide 32, sales of and retail commissions on lottery tickets or equipment. Sales of equipment to a telecommunications service provider to provide broadband in, unserved, in an unserved area. Okay, that one's effective for another year or so. And then the trade-in value of tangible personal property is excluded from the sales price when everything occurs in one transaction. So you can reduce your taxable amount if you have a trade-in that reduces it reduces the taxable amount if it's in the same transaction. Okay, bear with me. Last slide on exemptions. Okay, so the sales price for um, motor vehicles or titled vehicles by a non-resident and who is willing to basically submit an affidavit saying you're not going to keep it here in the state of Wyoming. There are states that say, hey, if you purchase it in our state, You've got to pay our tax, and then if you're going to go somewhere else, you got to pay theirs. The state of Wyoming doesn't do that, but I, there are other states that do. And then the last one, our, our most generally our most recent exemption is sales of lodging services offered by any county fair board during a county fair. And this came out of uh, fairly recent litigation as well. So, okay. Um, now, Mr. Chairman, I, I did originally have kind of a sales tax quiz since, since the committee is now experts on sales taxability <laughs> here in the state of Wyoming, but you can see how you have this unique mix. You have very few imposition statutes, right? But then you have a lot of things that are not taxable, but then going either even further, you have a bunch of exemptions, and that's hard. That, that's hard for our vendors to really navigate those challenges. But uh, I did have a sales tax quiz kind of on page 34. So if you got an oil change for your car, would that be sales taxable? And I'll just run through these just in the spirit of time. Candy bar purchased from the grocery store, my annual insurance payment, a green fee, ticket to UW versus Texas Tech football game, round trip plane ticket from Cheyenne to Denver to North Carolina and back. New collared shirt from my brother's wedding, dozen bagels from a local bakery, cough syrup, uh, $175 for the sprinkler guy to come fix my broken valve. These were actually my purchases recently, as you can tell. Paid the electricity bill, paid the water bill, uh, filled up my tank with gas, and then I bought fertilizer because thank you for the rain. Okay, and so and then if I just go to the next page, slide 35, you can see the answers there. And uh, a lot of points here are, um, yeah, it just gets a little hard. So, Mr. Chairman, 
As I continue to ask questions in uh, my role at the Department of Revenue, this is where I keep putting myself in the shoes of these retailers. At what point, you know, this is not, their business is selling shoes, you know, uh, running a convenience store. Uh, but in addition, we, as the state of Wyoming, ask them to know these laws, collect a tax from their customers, report that to the Department of Revenue, because the way our laws read upon audit, when the Department of Audit goes in and goes through all of their uh, receipts, their invoices, and determines whether that was a taxable event or not, it's that retailer vendor that gets dinged. If they didn't collect it from that customer, now they're on the hook for coming up with those funds. Uh, so that being said, uh, that is the spirit in which we come to you here in a little bit in trying to clarify um, some of these items uh, because you and I all know every one of those exemption statutes have a great story behind them to tell. Yeah, representatives want to Thanks. Just a question on that example. How often does that happen where someone's improperly administered the tax and then they're on the hook for it? Do you keep track of that? Is it a number of people? Is it a certain monetary amount? Mr. Panning, you want to take a stab at that? Sure, Mr. Chairman, Representative Zwanser, yes. Uh, and again, th this comes from knowledge from both my time with the Department of Audit and with the Department of Revenue. And those stats are generally available in their annual report. So the reason, the reason I'm a good person to maybe speak to both of these is because the Department of Audit and the Department of Revenue are separate agencies. We know that here in the state of Wyoming, and it's been studied several times by the legislature if that's a good or bad thing, but I still sign those assessments. The, when I sign them, they come in my name, the Department of Audit does it, I sign them. Uh, generally, yes, there is going to be an assessment. If the Department of Audit does their due diligence and visits a taxpayer, yes, generally there is going to be an assessment. Not all the time, right? That It's not all the time, but generally, based on my experiences, and this is available in the Department of Audit's uh, annual report, you are going to see an assessment for taxes not being collected properly, accrued properly, knowing what's taxable and what's not. The other thing, Mr. Chairman, um, we'll kind of just do a brief preview of our website at, at the end of this presentation. Webinars, taxability advices, um, if you're a business because of these very unique situations, we get emails on a daily basis, you know, here's the circumstance. Is that a taxable event? Should I be collecting sales tax? In every one of those, we provide written responses and every one of those written responses can be appealed. Those are um, final actions from the Department of Revenue. Uh, and we're doing uh, what we believe based on case law, statutory language, the, we're giving the right advice. Um, but obviously that can be challenged uh, and litigation from my perspective, it's not a good thing. Litigation is where we are spending time, effort, both at the Department of Revenue and typically the uh, retailer vendor uh, in Businesses is not our focus, and we shouldn't have to. I, I really believe that uh, clarification of statutes just will benefit everyone. Um, but I hope that answers your question, Representative. I, mean, I was really more, Mr. Chairman, looking for either uh, a number or a monetary amount. If there's a certain average, these people in good faith messed up. And nothing, ca my overall question, nothing catastrophic that puts somebody out of business for a, a simple mistake, I guess, is my worry. Or does, has anybody come close to that? Mr. Chairman, Representative Zwanser, that's a loaded question. Um, the answer to your figure, yes, there is a dollar amount per year that the Department of Audit and the Department of Revenue assess our taxpayers. And it's uh, it varies by year. It does. 
the average assessment will vary by taxpayer as well, right? You have some of the largest oil companies in the world. They are just inherently going to have different business and maybe different complications than your small mom and pop. And so giving you an average assessment, yeah, we could probably calculate that, but I don't think it's what you're quite looking for. Uh, every taxpayer dollar is sacred. I, I hold that true. I, um, $50 means more to some businesses than others. And, and, but we do have that dollar amount. It's available on the Department of Revenue's website and the Department of Audit's website. Okay, uh, Senator McEwen. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. So I, I know that if I'm late, it's a 10% charge and a 1.5% interest charge and it looks like the IRS is coming after me. Now, if I make a mistake in an audit, are those charges still the same? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Fanning. Mr. Chairman, Senator McEwen, yes, they are. Yes. Um, if there is a debt due to the state of Wyoming, there is going to be interest on it. Now, in our statutes, and the department is generally very good with this, if it's your first time audit, we will not charge you a penalty but interest is per statute and there's very little wiggle room that we have. So you're going to pay the tax and the interest generally, if it is good faith and the department does have some discretion here and director Anson is advocate about this, of helping out our taxpayers as statutorily as we can, we're going to do that for the penalty portion. Uh, Senator Ide. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Just a quick question. Do you have a, a, a number for us on, say, 2022 total sales tax revenue collected? Uh, do you have that off the top of your head? Just trying to see what 1%, you know, does 1% uh, uh, at a time effectively, but we'll just divide it by four if you have a total number. Yeah, thank you. Mr. Chairman and uh, Senator Ide, if you'll turn to page seven. Uh, that would be the fiscal year 2022 sales tax distributions. And, and, and that'll break that down. Um, you'll notice that uh, Brett identified the fifth penny uh, sales tax collections, the sixth pen, penny, and then over to, over to the right, you'll see the state sales tax and then uh, lodging tax and then county total for that $1,136,000,000. Uh, for 2022. And then some of the historical numbers are on following pages. Uh, follow up? Yeah, thank you for that. So if I go to this table, I see the fifth cent, which leaves a few of the counties out. Um, and then if we just go to state sales tax, this number is a little bit blurred on the bottom. Is that the number you're referring to right there? That the fourth line from the right, just on pure state sales tax. Mr. Pan. Mr. Chairman, Senator I, that's correct. So that number, I apologize for the blurriness. It's 728 million. Okay. And that would be generally the 70% of the 4%. That's what that figure is. All right, moving on. Okay. Mr. Chairman, great questions. Thank you. So on slide 36, generally, this is what our form looks like. Now, we have an electronic version available, but this is our Form 41. Most folks are monthly filers, but not all. Uh, we do have quarterly and annual. It's based on your sales tax volume. Sales tax, if you collect it in April, it's due by the end of May. So we basically give you a month, or not we, the statutes give you a month to send in your sales tax to us. It is important to note that this form's pretty basic, right? So you've got a gross sales figure, and then you've got this line B, which is everything that's not taxed. And then you net that out to a taxable sales and submit the tax based on this, right? This is all the information that we really get outside of an audit. And remember, um, this is good faith reporting. So the only way to verify 
the tax reporting is via an audit. Uh, if you do send in your tax early, like Senator mentioned, you do get a little break on your taxes. Uh, it is 1.95% off the first 6250 in tax, and then 1% of the tax up to $500. One of my most common suggestions is to simplify that calculation for our taxpayers. When you have small mom and pops, this can be a little challenging. And it took me a minute to really think about what this means. And it is something we have in our tax administration concept coming forward. But uh, vendor compensation amounts, yeah, this is, this is starting to be some real money here. And this is money that comes out of the state's portion. I cited the differences here, or cited the statutes for you to show you that it is coming out of the state's portion. But last year, $31 million. And this could be also perceived that this was tax that was given back to the taxpayers of the state of Wyoming too. So that is a thought. We're talking about a lot of money in vendor compensation. It has really started to escalate or um, grow is a really mu a much better term. A couple of reasons. We have a lot more electronic filers now, which the computer system can do it electronically for you. Education has been better. So there are a variety of reasons why this continues to grow. So on slide 38, uh, what do you need to document an exemption, right? So the state of Wyoming really has three different types of exemptions. So you've got entity-based, use-based, and product-based. So for the first two, entity-based and product-based, you need to provide the vendor an exemption certificate. They don't know you're exempt until you provide them this exemption certificate, right? And so that's federal, for entity-based, federal, state, religious, charitable. For use-based, okay, if it's for agricultural, manufacturing, resale, the vendor's not going to know you're exempt until you provide this documentation. Now, it's different with product-based, right? This exemption's available to everyone, non-prepared food, livestock, outbound freight, so you don't need an exemption certificate because it's available for everyone. These are taken in good faith by our vendors. Remember, sales tax in Wyoming is a good faith standard. So if the vendor takes an exemption certificate, they are under the impression that the purchaser knows they can claim a valid exemption and they're off the hook, right? So our vendors are off the hook if they collect a valid exemption certificate. These also generally don't expire right? And there's no renewal. And that's not per the state of Wyoming guidance. That's actually per the streamlined sales tax agreement, which I have a slide to discuss a little bit later. Okay. How about the next slide? On slide 39, Wyoming is part of the streamlined sales tax agreement. Uh, this was an agreement. It was collaboration among 24 different states. Started in the early 2000s, and Wyoming was really um, one of the founding members of this. There have been former Wyoming Department of Revenue directors and excise tax administrators that were truly instrumental in getting this compact together. What it really did was it unified exemption certificates, definitions, and really tax administration processes across these 24 states. So as you can see, Wyoming, uh, Colorado is not a member. They have some things that would you know, prevent them from joining Streamlined, okay? And you can see about half the country is. Now, the benefits of joining Streamlined mean, hey, um, you've got these consistent and uniform tax administration processes, and you're having vendors voluntarily submit information and taxpayer dollars to you. But the cost of that is, the state of Wyoming doesn't always have the flexibility it may like in its tax administration processes. So the state of Wyoming, you can generally, the legislature can generally say, hey, we want this to be taxable or this not. But once you start trying to do more creative things, um, generally that's going to put you out of compliance with the streamlined sales tax agreement. Maybe uh, 
charging out of state residents or uh, differently than in state residents or uh, oh, one that had come up recently was uh, we wanted to tax food. We wanted to allow the counties to decide if they wanted to tax food or not, right? So the streamlined sales tax agreement says, hey, if it's taxable, it's got to be taxable everywhere in your state. So there are strings attached to being in the streamlined sales tax agreement, but there are also benefits as well as you're receiving tax that you may not have received beforehand. But the impact of a Supreme Court decision, Wayfair versus South Dakota, completely changed my world a few years ago. Before you get to that, question just popped into my mind from this morning's conversation about electric, elect, elect, <laughs> electricity generation and transmission. So if, the, if you're generating electricity in Wyoming, transmitting it across state lines, um, to another company that's buying that, another utility say, is that a ta sales taxable event or is that exempt? Mr. Chairman, that's exempt. It's truly non-taxable. So in Wyoming, sourcing is based on where the customer takes possession of the product. So if you ship it across state lines, it's no longer Wyoming's taxation purview. It's gonna be the taxation responsibility of another uh, jurisdiction. So if you ship anything across state lines, right? And we hear this a lot with our manufacturers. So they're, they're gonna build something here in Wyoming, make something. A lot of those items do get shipped out of state and there is no sales taxation with sales that are shipped outside Wyoming's borders. Hmm. Interesting concept, okay. But by the same token, uh, Chairman Beitman, anything coming into Wyoming, regardless of where it comes from, has a use tax or sales tax, depending. Okay. So but we don't ruminated. have the population, right? Senator Ide looks curious down here. Let's talk to Senator Ide. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I just want to clarify. So if you purchase something, say in Idaho, and their, their uh, sales tax is 6.25%, and Ours is only four. Can you bring your receipt back and get a refund for that two and a half percent? Two or whatever, 2.25%? Yeah, thank you. Mr. Panning. Mr. Chairman, Senator, I, the answer is no on that one. The reason being, it's not our tax, right? You paid that tax to the state of Idaho. And so the state of Wyoming per statute, not per the Department of Revenue, says, hey, we'll give you an offsetting credit up to the tax that's due in your jurisdiction. The remaining 2.25% is state of Idaho tax. Now, if there is something the legislature wanted to do, um, that would be your purview. But right now, um, no, you would not get credit on an additional 2.25%. Senator McEwen. I just want to make sure I understood something you said earlier too. So if I went to Idaho and I bought something for a 3.25% tax and I came back to Wyoming, then it would be a Wyoming tax and I'd have to pay the difference. Is that correct? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Mr. Manning. Mr. Chairman, Senator McEwen, yes, that's correct. The vast majority of the time, yes. That seems unfair. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. Any more questions before we move on? Okay. Keep keep on a trucking. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. So on slide 40, uh, remote sellers, marketplace facilitators. It was born out of the Supreme Court decision, Wayfair versus South Dakota in June 2018. What this did, it was prior to this date. You had to have a physical location in a state to license with that state. This Supreme Court decision really left it up to the states. If a company had, cert had a certain amount of sales in your jurisdiction, you could now require them to license. This was completely different than before, right? Before, you had to have a physical location in a state for a state to require you to license. Now, 
you can do it if they meet certain economic thresholds. And the Supreme Court decision really left it up to the states on how they decided to administer it. Now, as you can see, essentially every single state that has a sales tax has adopted remote seller and marketplace facilitator language. Uh, I, I've been very fortunate to be uh, asked to be on several panels related to this discussion. And a lot of states said that if this hadn't been passed before COVID, they don't know what their state would have done. Because remember, everyone shifted to buying online. Now, I won't go as far as to say that here in Wyoming because our, our tax structure and our economy is just way different. But there are states that have said without Wayfair versus South Dakota, without remote sellers, without marketplace facilitators, we don't know how we would have survived COVID financially via taxes, right? That's how important this was. So remote sellers is, hey, if you're outside our state, but here in Wyoming, you make $100,000 or more, have 200 or separate more transactions, you need to license with us. Most states have adopted similar thresholds, right? So then a year later, and Wyoming was really at the forefront of this. It really was. A, few, a year later, Wyoming said, hey, if you're going to connect buyers and sellers via marketplace, you've also got a license with us. And that's important too, because the first one captured all of the sales that were coming into Wyoming via an online retailer. The marketplace facilitator captured when you're bringing together buyers and sellers on a large online marketplace. Mr. Fanning, Senator Pappas had a question. So, so did did Wayfair versus South Dakota completely nullify Quill versus North Dakota, or did any of that remain uh, from the earlier court case, Mr. Fanning? Mr. Chairman, Senator Pappas, uh, outstanding question and. The answer to that is it really transformed sales tax collection throughout the United States. The Supreme Court left it up to the states on how they wanted to administer sales tax. So the answer is um, it didn't completely wipe out everything. There were still some nexus terms that remained in that legislation. But overall, the Supreme Court said, hey, states, Quill versus North Dakota no longer applies, you can now administer sales tax based on economic thresholds as opposed to physical thresholds. So the, the answer to that is really the guiding light is the Supreme Court left it up to the states as opposed to saying, no, you can't do that. So I did want to briefly touch on slide 41 on contractors. As if you can remember before, we don't license contractors. They don't have any imposition statutes for their services. So any work to real property is not sales taxable here in the state of Wyoming. But these contractors, they're the end consumers of the materials that they use. So I put just a picture in here of YDOT. This is... If they're using contractors, those contractors have got to pay tax on the materials because they're the end consumer, and we don't have any imposition statutes for our contractors because they work on real property. And so this is a common perception that, hey, if I'm going to work for an exempt entity, I don't have to pay tax. Well, if you're working on real property, that's a little different. And we've actually got a full section of statutes related to contractors, resident contractors, non-resident contractors, all with the focal point of making sure tax is paid on those materials when they're brought into Wyoming for use or used in work to real property. Slide. Uh, hold on a second. Senator uh, Pappas. But that's not, that doesn't hold true if, if, if the project is a state or local entity that's not taxable, is that correct? So if we build a school, are all those materials exempt because it's a government facility, Mr. Fanning? Mr. Chairman, Senator Pappas, it depends on who's buying the materials. 
Okay, so the labor is always going to be exempt. There, there's no imposition statute. Rather, it's non-taxable. But who is purchasing the materials? If a contractor is purchasing it, purchasing the materials, they're taxable to them, even if they're building a school. Okay, but if the school district purchases the materials, then they can claim an exemption, right? And so we do have uh, complexities, I'm going to say, on who is purchasing the materials and are you doing labor-only contracts or are you trying to purchase the materials from the same, there are complexities there. Follow -up. There's a follow-up coming, Mr. Fanning. Yeah, I am. And I guess that was my point, because I've seen that in, in all of my projects, uh, where the school district will purchase the HVAC equipment and, you know, just to avoid the tax. And, and frankly, I'm not so sure we even, why we even go through that, that, I mean, it just raises the cost of our schools anyhow, right? We're taxing ourselves Right, we, we're taxing, and we, we're giving that money back to ourselves. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense that we we tax materials on public projects. Wouldn't you agree? We have some agreement at the other end, so you don't have to answer that question. But uh, do we have any other questions on this side of the room? Okay, we're good. All right, keep going, Mr. Fanning. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairman. Truly appreciate the time. So I did want to, on slide 42, just the most common discussion points that I'm going to hear every single day. And I'm actually going to start with the right side of this chart on slide 42. So what am I going to hear from taxpayers, right? And I hear from them every single day, just, just like this committee does as well. Number one thing, why is it so hard? That truly is the one thing I'm going to hear from a lot right now. The second most question that I'm going to get asked from taxpayers is, hey, I just registered my LLC in Wyoming. Do I need a sales tax license? And I've got several slides to outline that issue coming up next. Next one, I just got a Wyoming sales tax license. I don't have any sales or in Wyoming, and I've never even been to Wyoming. I looked at my account and see I have a balance. Why? Right? Maybe that's because you licensed with us to get some of these exemptions and a sales tax exemption certificate, and then didn't follow through on your part of the bargain to submit monthly returns to us, have due diligence, those kind of aspects. What's an exemption certificate? Yep, we're going to hear about that a lot. What is use tax? This has fallen down the list. It really has because the vast majority of use tax is now being collected. Once we got as sales tax, yeah, it's being collected as sales tax. Once we got some of those major online retailers to start collecting our sales tax, transformed sales tax collection in Wyoming and truly throughout the country. So we, we still have use tax. I think last fiscal year, 50 some million submitted primarily by businesses. But use tax is still a thing. It's just not as common amongst just residents and citizens. Oh, my contractor just charged me sales tax. I thought you said Wyoming contractors don't charge sales tax. This is hard. It goes to Senator Pappas's question as well. Uh, if I have someone come and fix my sprinkler valve, I should see $175 on that bill. In the background of that, that $175, I paid that contractor for the labor for the materials, for the tax he paid, for the markup, for the transportation to, for him to come to my house, all of that's included in my price. But that gets complicated for some contractors, especially if they sell at retail and they also work on real property. There's two different taxation paths there and it gets complicated. My company works in the oil fields. Can you explain that sales taxability? Okay. Yes. Sales tax building in the oil fields taxable or is very complex. When I talk to my counterparts across the country, it's just way more simple if it's all taxable or nothing's taxable. And that's truly, I used that for years when I was training new auditors. I would start them out on things where everything is taxable or nothing's taxable because it's, it's more simple, 
right? You can get the grasp and, and then move forward from there. Uh, how do I get a refund of sales tax I overpaid? That's a common question we get as well. And it happens. It, it truly does happen where you've been overcharged and you are due a refund. How do you get that back? Okay, among DOR staff, uh, why is sales tax so complicated? Same thing with our taxpayers. Number two is navigating the streamlined sales tax agreement. It really does take a lot of time to stay in compliance with this agreement. It really does. Uh, I have multiple people working on this. Um, when you sign up through the streamlined sales tax agreement, you have different rules than if you sign up through the state of Wyoming. And not necessarily the best time to get into that conversation, but it's true. There are different rules if you go through the streamlined sales tax agreement than if you go through the state of Wyoming. Registered agents and LLCs, yes. Based on Wayfair versus South Dakota and online marketplaces, changed our world, right? So years and years ago, you always went to Delaware, right, to register your LLC? Always did. It was Delaware, okay? The next best place was Wyoming, and it's been that way for a very long time. The difference between Wyoming and Delaware is that Wyoming has sales tax. Okay, so you can get a sales tax license from us, buy wholesale for resale, gain business legitimacy, all of these common questions that we're dealing with. Uh, registered agents, LLC is huge. Licensing out of state, out of country vendors. Remember, you've got a very tax friendly tax structure here, and there are pros and cons, certainly. Trying to collect on liabilities due to the state of Wyoming. Uh, I have a slide on that coming up. Managing craft shows, trade shows, and garage sales, right? They sell tangible personal property. Are they licensing with us? Do I want my staff working every single Saturday to make sure they're in compliance? Okay. Uh, IT, always tricky. And then revoking sales tax licenses. I remember when revoking sales tax licenses was the sacred process. It truly was. Uh, you went through kind of a hearing. It's not the case anymore. Vast majority of licenses I revoke are from the Middle East of the world, not the United States, the Middle Eastern countries of the world. Um, among others, there are others. Okay, uh, slide 43. I just wanted to shed some kind of fun facts. This is from March of 2023. Uh, even these facts would be slightly outdated. Our data changes daily. And so the next couple slides. I wanted to make sure, and I wanted to thank Director Henson, and I wanted to thank our IT contractor, and I wanted to thank the legislature for dedicate, having a dedicated IT budget for the state of Wyoming Department of Revenue. I had this vision to build this database. Director Henson said, do it. Our IT contractor, using funds within our already contract, made some things happen. Now we can query our data like we've never been able to before. And then thank you, legislature. I know I come to you with these huge fiscal notes all the time. I get that. And many of you have been frustrated at me with that. But wow, if there is ever a really good investment, the Department of Revenue's IT budget really helps everyone. Everyone here in the state of Wyoming that's submitting tax to us. Okay, so we're we're going to at, at, again, we took in at this time 16,000 sales tax returns, right? The vast majority of these, we don't have any questions necessarily. 80% were submitted electronically. Um, I've talked to some states, they've mandated electronic filing. It just saves a lot of money. Um, something, maybe it's a discussion in the future. And then you have opt out if you still want to do it manually. Uh, 31 sale, 31% 31 of sales were reported as taxable. This number taken with a grain of salt, right? Because this means that 70% of the sales reported to the Department of Revenue were not taxed. Again, second time taken with a grain of salt. If you go back to our Form 41, we have taxpayers who um, the department can do better educating them on what goes in your gross sales. We have some companies that report international sales 
on their returns to us and then deduct out everything except for Wyoming. We also have some vendors who only report taxable sales. Biggest companies you can think of said, that's a lot easier for me. <clears throat> okay, so again, really take them with a grain of salt there. 63% are going to receive vendor comp, and they did in this one. 14% of the accounts involved streamlined sales tax agreement. 9% had use tax on them, and 4% submitted lodging tax to us. Now, this chart to the right is fascinating to me. Remember, I, this is my world. I love it. Okay, but just ranking here, uh, and again, just, just general here. So who had the most gross sales in March of 2023? And you can see mineral, mineral, retail, mineral, retail. Those are the companies that had the most sales reported to us. What about deductions? Okay, mineral, mineral, retail, mineral, mineral, right? So the, top, the same four are the exact same. Then if we go to taxable sales, right? We've got retail, retail, utility, mineral, utility. And you can see how that dynamic shifted. Now, I'm not saying whatsoever the mineral industry does not uh, submit a huge portion of tax to us. If we did the top, top 50, they would be in there. Uh, they most certainly would. But this was just March of 2023. And then collected sales tax, right? You've got retail, county treasurer. That was a surprise to me. But remember, they collect our tax on motor vehicles. Those are big purchases, right? And then you've got retail, utility, mineral. And so that's kind of the breakdown. And, and this is going to change, right? It is going to change based on the month. But this, this was fascinating for me. And we couldn't do this several months ago. Now we have the tools to do some of the analysis as like in these coming slides. Mr. Fanning, can you hit the high points? We're, we're kind of running out of time. You got it. Okay. Okay. So on slide 44, um, I wanted to make sure, as you can see, the Department of Revenue's workload is truly increasing. Truly, right? We went from 16,000 licenses to, to 47,000 in less than a decade. And so the main part of this slide is I wanted to make sure that the legislature knew how much the Department of Revenue truly values the raises that have been given to us over the past two years. This slide demonstrates that. Now, you know, they, they didn't necessarily, right, deserve versus earned. They are earning their paycheck. And this work truly does show that, right? We've got a tremendous amount of work that's being done by our folks. Truly, they're phenomenal. Okay, uh, vendors by state, if someone calls me, most of the time they're not going to be from Wyoming. They truly aren't. As you can see this, 58% of our vendors, they're not in Wyoming. That's the intent of this slide. Okay, if we go to slide 46, okay, licenses by county. Most of our licenses aren't in Wyoming anymore. They aren't. But as you can see, the, the, I've highlighted multiple locations. So 2% of the licenses actually submit 32% of the tax. And the multiple Wyoming locations, these are your big box retailers. They are. We allow them to port, report one return under uh, multiple locations under one return. And then as you can see, we're in Sheridan County, Mr. Co-Chairman. 5% of our licenses are in Sheridan County. Why is that? Because there is a registered agent in Sheridan County that is famous. Really, 4% of our active licenses have one address associated with them. Really, truly. And so we've got thousands of businesses that are using one location here in the state of Wyoming. And it's... It's a tough topic for our office. We are dealing with Sheridan County on a daily basis. We truly are. And a lot of conversation uh, 
related to registered agents and taxes. Okay. Slide 47, um, where would you like to find $24 million? Okay, this is how much in taxes, fees are due to the state of Wyoming, $24 million. And as you can see, the vast majority of that, we're probably not gonna collect, right? Because they're out-of-state vendors. Can't put liens on them, right? They're not reporting, maybe they're even out of the country. Okay, I did just want to highlight. So here's how the Department of Revenue is broken down. We've got 34 employees. I've got two sections. I've got five people that are, they do a lot more, but they're primarily dedicated to answering taxability questions. And then I've got four regions in my vendor operations section. Region one, uh, generally going to deal with our tobacco accounts, Colorado accounts. And then region two, Sheridan County. I mean, that's really what we're doing. And my highlighted here are, I have field offices throughout the state. Region three, dealing with Streamline. And then region four, all the building going on in Teton County. Okay, that's really what's happening here. Plus it doesn't include our administrative services division, which really does a lot of the mailing, payment processing and tax distributions. It's important to note, that between my vendor operations manager, my education taxability manager, and my four region supervisors, I have over 140 years of experience in those positions. So when your constituents, when your taxpayers call my office, they should have some very good confidence that they're going to get a consistent, clear, and concise answer when they call the Department of Revenue. And with that, Mr. Chairman, last slide, um, our website has some amazing resources. Please, if your constituents ever have questions, have them call me, have them visit this website, and we can help them. Thank you, Mr. Fanning. You guys run a tight ship down there and appreciate your enthusiasm for sales and use tax. <laughs> Any questions for DOR on this issue? Any questions? I think we got pretty covered it pretty thoroughly. Um, thank you very much. Um, Ms. Henson, Director Henson, do you have anything to add? Uh, Mr. Chairman, as I stated, uh, the next item are, is our list of administrative issues. Um, Brett, I think has done a great job identifying each of those, but there are 18 on that list. And we certainly know that uh, time is short today. So, However, you would like us to, um, you know, if you want us to answer questions, if you want to come back to this at a future meeting, we're willing to do that. If you want to, uh, if you've had an opportunity to take a look at this list and you're just looking um, and have a few questions, we'll be happy to do that. Uh, but we certainly know that it would take time to look at these 18 topics and really delve into the reason why these are uh, questions and if you'd like us to move forward. Uh -huh. right. Yeah, Mr. Co-Chair. How long do you think, I mean, you got 18 of these, and just to kind of, and these are things that you would maybe like us if we can develop a bill to solve some of these issues. Yes, Mr. Chairman, and uh, the, the thought was, you know, we don't want to advocate a certain policy or not, but we could certainly work with LSO in developing options, you know, take, you know, go to the statute, here are some options as far as language, and you could discuss uh, to that extent. Uh, there's some general ones uh, related, uh, for example, those annual exemption reports, you may recall, uh, a year ago, we had uh, given a report um, related to how we collect that type of information and how we believe that it really has a lot of shortcomings to that information. We don't believe that it's probably uh, a full representation of what those economic incentive uh, exemptions are accomplishing. Uh, and we've got some work that we're uh, doing uh, outside of the legislature to try and move forward to get better information. So again, I, I'm just, I believe if we start talking about each one of them, it, it may take some time. And I, 
I just didn't know if you wanted to go ahead and proceed with that now. Uh, Brett, do you think 18 times a minute each, is that possible or no? Mr. Fanning. Mr. Chairman, Director Anson, uh, you know me. Um, <laughs> what, what we could do is maybe highlight some, some of these top ones, if that's acceptable to the committee, but I, I am open to anything. Again, these, these are clarification topics. Okay. Well, let me ask the audience um, before we move off of sales tax issues. Is there anybody in the room that came here to comment on sales tax issues, public comment on sales tax issues? Clar Clarissa, is there anybody on Zoom? There's nobody, no public comment on sales tax issues. Okay. So then I guess what we could do is give us a very brief overview and we can, we can read, you don't have to read us verbatim the 18 issues, but just give us the overview of what issues you see. And then the committee, if we have any specific questions on any one of them, we can ask you those and then we'll take public comment on those and we'll close this out um, and take a break before we go to the next issue. Is that, does that sound fair to everybody? Okay, let's do that. Mr. So. Chairman, thank you. Here we go. Okay, so the first one, annual exemption surveys. We, we can't give you good information based on the current statutes that we have and the guidance. They aren't required to report to us on these exemption surveys and our response rates are very poor. So we'd like to give you better information. Uh, very similar happens with our propane, butane, and liquefied gas surveys as well. Now our response rates are better, but any of that money, 10% goes to the highway fund. So even if we miss $1, that highway fund's not getting what it needs, right? So we're talking about possibly some teeth there or some clarification or collaboration. Number three, Intent, repair, alteration, or improvement of tangible personal property. Uh, it, is it the legislator's intent that something has to be added to that service? If Does something not qualify if it's de minimis? Remember, we had a recent court case that called this into question, and it has tax dollar figures associated with it. Number four, what does in the transportation business mean? Right? Does that include uh, freight companies? Does that include oil filled companies, pipelines, locomotives? Okay, digital products. Is it the legislator's intent that if I go to a movie theater, a movie rental store, or stream the exact same movie that I'm taxed differently? Okay, number six, vendor compensation. We talked about this. Again, no policy, and we don't want to change, it, but is there a way to clarify it for our vendors to make it easier for those small vendors to truly be able to calculate this on the, by themselves? Number seven, resort district tax. The statute says you have to be physically located in the district to charge the district tax. That's not what, what's happening right now. It's not. All of a large portion of our online vendors are already charging this tax. You just want to make it that way because that's what's happening in practice right now. Number eight, refund approvals or denials. This goes to the distinction between the Department of Audit and the Department of Revenue. And we have something in statute that says, hey, we got to get a quick response to the taxpayer. What if that expertise is better with the Department of Audit? There's nothing in there that says approve or deny or give the Department of Audit. That would help clarify for our statutes so that they know if something's been approved or denied or whatever it is. Okay. Excise tax appeals. So anytime I do something where the Department of Revenue makes a determination, uh, there's precedent that it really creates this never ending cycle of information. Is that good for the taxpayer? Is it good for the state board? Is it good for the department? When taxpayers can then bring information that was not available when the original assessment or determination is made. 
Okay, number 10, vendor licensing thresholds. Does the legislature want us going to garage sales, craft shows, trade shows? Is it time to really start talking about a threshold where up to a certain amount, you don't have to license with us? Okay. Voluntarily licensing. Is it time to have this discussion of, should we go away from voluntarily licensing? It is causing a lot of folks a lot of work. And these accounts are not as compliant as the folks who have to register with us. And a lot of the voluntarily licensing is outside Wyoming and via the streamlined sales tax agreement. Now we don't always have, we don't have complete control over number 11 because we're in the streamlined sales tax agreement. You have something, Mr. Director? Mr. Chairman, I'd just like to emphasize um, they're registering with us. They're allowed to get a sales tax exemption certificate. We are accepting that registration. They never report to us. They re never remit any sales. Uh, but that is a process that we've got to go through legally, whether we do a revoc revocation. Um, and that's the question is, do we somehow qualify them and say, you know, are, are you going to make sales? Are you going to remit? Um, it, it's just become, become an administrative burden by which the taxing authorities are never getting any sales tax dollars. Uh, but we have a lot of those on the books right now. And uh, it's a challenge. So it's just a, a big discussion that. Uh, while there were definitely some positives to Wayfair and remote sellers, it, it also opened the door to some other items <clears throat> that were unintentional. Mr. Chairman, continuing on, number 12, the manufacturing exemption. The point here is just to clarify. There's two qualifies in here that you must have a certain NAICS code. And there's really little opportunity for the department to verify this because some manufacturers don't have a licensing requirement with us, or maybe even they provide incomplete information, or maybe they don't even know that they're a manufacturer, right? And so again, not removing the manufacturing one bit, it's just, if you're gonna make something, you qualify for the exemption or something along those lines. Number two, does not include non-capitalized machinery except machinery expense in accordance with section 179 of the Internal Revenue Code. Again, what, what exactly did that mean? So generally we administer this as, hey, if it's a piece of equipment for a lifespan of less than a year, um, that doesn't qualify. It's gotta be bigger pieces of equipment. But again, in practicality, um, I'm not sure everyone understands that language anyway. Number 13, user fee taxation. Okay, so there's an exemption for admission or user fees to county or municipally owned recreation facilities, but generally user fees lack an imposition statute. So did the legislature intend for user fees to be taxable? And, and that's just a question we, we've kind of always had. Remote seller thresholds, number 14, uh, streamlined is working with states to try and remove the 200 transaction threshold, right? So you can kind of get rid of your, uh, hey, I'm selling 200 pens into your state and then just keep the dollar threshold, right? And a lot of states, including South Dakota, who is instrumental in this whole process, has moved to just 100,000. Oil-filled imposition statutes, um, Legislature's worked on this for as long as I can personally remember. Um, it's complicated. It really is. Is it, again, the time to look at these statutes? It's complicated. It really is. Number 16, principal residence for motor vehicles. So motor vehicles are different. It's ba your tax based on where your personal residence is. So you generally go down to the courthouse and pay your sales tax. How does this work for snowbirds? 
And this is really a concept that's happening a lot in this part of the state and in our, in our destination parts where um, there's not really a definition of personal residence. The Department of Revenue kind of has a rule, but it's it could be made more clear, but it, just clarification there. Okay, number 17, as you saw in my previous testimony, there's kind of two aircraft, FAA, uh, is there a way that you can combine those to simplify it for the taxpayers who are in this industry? And last but not least, number 18, um, there's actually some language in the admission imposition statute that says, hey, if you are admitting someone for free, you've got to charge yourself an equivalent tax. I'm, I'm racking my brain on how someone would know to even track that. If you're less than... And I put in here maybe a children's ticket, but I don't. I just don't know how that would be tracked. And so I, I don't even know if it's being used. And this is the excise tax administrator. Is there an opportunity to clarify it there? So with that, Mr. Co-Chairman, how did I do? <laughs> hey, we're, we just made up a lot of time right through there. Okay. <laughs> um, committee, any questions on these 18 items? Anything you want more information on or feel comfortable reaching out to Brad or Director Henson if you do have any questions. Uh, okay, so I have a question for our trustee legal counsel. Um, Josh, I assume it would be okay if, if we did a working group and they came up with a, a list, maybe all 18 make it into a bill draft. Could we do an omnibus uh, property tax administration amendments bill to fit all three of them in since they're all within chapter 15. Um, I would think it would fit the single subject rule. Is that correct? Uh, I believe so, Mr. Chairman. No, I have to get into it, but I think we could do it broad enough to be uh, yeah, sales tax administration revisions and, and do one bill. So we wouldn't if need that, if that was the, what bills. the committee wanted to do. Okay. Okay. We will we will volunteer some people to work on this during the next between now and the next meeting. Um, all right, anybody else have any questions before we close out tax administration? Okay, any public comment in the room on tax administration issues? Nothing in the room, Clarissa? Nobody's Zooming with us today? All right, so we'll close that out. And then, um, oh yeah, we do have the State Board of Equalization coming up next. Committee, let's take a quick 10 minute uh, break so we can adjust, get ready for the last, uh, the home stretch here. So we'll take a 10 minute break, be back at 340.
Ladies and gentlemen, let's take your seats um, and welcome back to the Revenue Committee's discussion on tax administration issues. We have the St Wyoming State Board of Equalization here uh, to give us a little bit of a talk. Floor is yours. Please introduce yourself to the Revenue Committee and the general public. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. My name is Jane Mockler. I'm a board member on the State Board of Equalization. I think a lot of you met me last year when we talked about Senate File 39. That bill died in the House. Um, so I'm not really going to go into detail about it as much detail as I might have earlier in the day, but I did want to touch about a few things that I've given you some handouts. I've also got some answers to some of the questions that came up yesterday in the review of the property tax system. I think Mr. Gill went through what the Board of Equalization was. He included our rules. He really gave you kind of an overview of the whole property tax appeal system, et cetera. So I don't want to belabor it and do that again. So maybe just to start off, I thought I would give you the things from newest to oldest. And the first things I gave you were the 2023 Wyoming assessed market value, and it's a handout. We finished our abstract reviews on Friday. And so on Monday morning, I had our statistician run a preliminary report of that he does for me every year, but this is the preliminary report of the state's assessed valuation and market value for 2023. And it shows you each county, there are two reports here. The first is the actual numbers of the value of each of them. And then the last report gives you an idea of how much property taxes went up in each of the four categories that we look at. And then in addition, state assessed property and minerals. So if you were to go pick on Sheridan County, because that's where we are, and I think that's where the chairman's from. So it, what it kind of, if you go to Sheridan County, you'll find out that locally assessed property went up 18%. And the uh, um, minerals in Sheridan County went up 57%. The state assessed non-minerals, which we outlined down at the lower half on the bottom part of the page, because it shows you then what is state assessed property. That went up 8%, and it shows you that for Sheridan County for 2023, your assessed valuation went up 17%. Um, some of these counties went up astronomically, <laughs> and at least that's what I think. Uh, sublet, Converse, they went up significantly, and that's minerals. And um, you talk about the different kinds of taxes. One of them is a personal property tax. And I think what you can really see, and if this doesn't really drill down into it, but if you look at Laramie County, one of the locally assessed, the, price, the value went up significantly. And a lot of that is, is one kind of taxpayer. And these data processing centers are worth billions. And so that's really significantly changed Laramie County. So, and then when you look at Teton County, um, which is in a land of its own. Uh, Teton County's assessed valuation is all, almost all, in local assessed. And so what I would always caution you is it, is it ends up being a pretty broad-based tax. In Laramie County, it's locally assessed for, for personal property. For Campbell County, it's minerals. For Sublet County, it's minerals. Converse County, it's minerals. For... Um, Teton County, again, it's houses. So it just gives you a variety that shows you that every single area of Wyoming is different and its tax structure based, its property tax structure is different. So I always think that's just an interesting chart to kind of give you a sense of what changed in, between 2022 and 2023. Yesterday, I know that um, Mr. Uh, uh, Gill went through how we do assessments and we have in a, a, a statistician, who's as excited about statistics as, as uh, Mr. Fanning is about sales tax. And <laughs> it is kind of amazing that someone can spend an entire year creating and developing Excel spreadsheets that will be able to drill down into every single piece of property in the state of Wyoming, and then tell us why it changed and how it changed. And then in June, for the month of June, we as a board review all of them. And then we meet with every county assessor and we go through the statistics that they've given you, that they've given us within the guidelines, both of the Department of Revenue and the State of Wyoming and the Board of Equalization. And so the state, we invite the board, I mean, the Department of Revenue to join us. They can ask questions of the assessors. I think they get a sense from them what's working, what's not working, how many appeals they have, how do they handle the appeal process. And in addition to that, they review the statistics. So if we brought Sheridan County for two reasons, one is that we're here and two, it's perfect. I know that 
surprising, but Sheridan County's statistical review is, is pretty exactly what you would want to look at. And part of it is he gets enough sales. Um, he gets enough sales in all four of the areas that we look at. There are counties in this state that never get a commercial sale or never get any commercial vacant sales. And so it makes the assessor's job turn into a lot of extraction and it's, you know, just guessing is what I think it seems guessing, but they really go back and do allocations. They do a lot of work to try to figure out if the price of residential improved is significantly increased and the price of residential land significantly increased. Does that imply that truly commercial has as well. But in Sheridan County, they get enough sales and that's really what this comes down to. And they talked about that yesterday with the stratification. And I think the assessors made it very clear that that's something they get to do as long as they stratify such that they get enough sales to meet the data that we're looking at. So the medians, you know, so that you can look at the CODs, the dispersion and find the outliers. And we throw outliers out because we're not really trying to base property values on some guy that bought a $20 million house and <laughs> some guy that sold his for minus, minus money. Um, and they do vary quite a bit. This year, if you built a $300,000 house in Niagara County, you can sell it for $200,000. Um, so that's kind of where the cost tables show you that a lot of people talked yesterday about the cost tables have gone up significantly, but there are other factors. It's just one of the factors in the valuation of the property. But I thought that what you would also see from this is that we don't ever look at a, a county and, and do anything other than just sort of gauge it until something's really gone awry for about five years. And then if after a couple of years, we'll, we'll send them a letter. And if it gets a little bit anxious, we send them a work plan. Eventually we send them an, uh, an order that says thou shalt clean this up. And uh, the very last thing is a uh, equalization. And I think the last equalization was for a part of Natrona County. And that was about 15 years ago for a neighborhood in Natrona County. Yesterday, you com there was a comment, I think that what is the definition of full market value? Well, you all have defined that and you've defined it by saying that you'll reach full value. So you, you do all this data, you get all this data for the sales, but then you are saying that through the rules and through statute that we want to get to full market value, but we're willing to go within 20%, 10%, 90% to 110% is what the department's rules are. Ours are 95 to, um, to 105. And I think what we're trying to say is that there needs to be a little bit of leeway with the taxpayers. So full value, if you were to look at this, would be 2023. 20, and you'd look and you'd see that the one at the PRD, I mean, he's really getting close to full value. He's not. And the medians are 96. So the 96, if they're under 95, we start thinking you really aren't at full value. And almost, honestly, the other thing I would say is the differences between the rules of the department and the rules of the board, they're very micro oriented and we're very macro oriented. We look at everything as a whole for a county. So when we look at stratification, we're not looking at an individual neighborhood and seeing if all their medians are correct. Well, my statistician probably does, but I don't have to. We're looking at the whole of the county. And so I just thought this would be an interesting thing for you guys to see. Um, yesterday, I think there was a question about how many appeals there were. We um, won't see those appeals. We're still working appeals from last year. And although the deadline to get the appeals to us is October 1st, I think it's now more like a guideline than an actual rule. And uh, I think that's Pirates of the Caribbean. Um, and the reason for that is, is that some of these counties have been having an inordinate amount of appeals, maybe just one and uh, maybe two, and so they're behind. And so we don't count it against them. We let the t it work itself through the process. As long as the taxpayer has met the 30 day window to appeal, and then we let the county work itself through those appeals. So the year of Natrona County, I think had 3000 appeals. It did take them longer than October 1st to get through them all. It took them longer this year. And so we, you know, we kind of realized that as long as the actual deadlines have been met in terms of the appeal process, we let them go a little bit further. Um, la this year, I think there were over 5,000 people who came to their different county assessors and said, 
what's going on with my taxes. And a lot of the assessors said a lot of them were because they were just angry, but a lot of them were because it says I've got a barn on here and that barn burned down last year. And so the assessor has that opportunity to go through, look at the property. Most of the assessors, if someone comes in, try to get to that property that day, say, okay, let's go out and look at it. Um, but there were 5,000 people that really, over a little over 5,000 people, 2,000 of them were in one county. Um, and then, so you kind of get a sense that there are counties that don't have a lot of taxpayers coming to them and saying what's going on. They'll find out in their community that people aren't happy about it, but they all probably figure, you know, I know that's what my neighbor's house sold. So what you're really looking at when they come to the desk review is to clean up the information. I think this, the department made it really clear how critical that is to make sure you've got the right characteristics. A lot of times you'll find that people will come in and say, my basement isn't finished. How do you know that? And they'll say Zillow. And um, so I think it surprises taxpayers <laughs> that people that they have so many public resources to look at. So of those 5,000 people that came in, about four to 600 people um, filed appeals of their taxes. And um, again, most of them, the majority of them, 500 of those are from two counties. The rest of them count are statewide. There are counties that haven't had appeal in 20 years. And, and there are counties that get appeals all the time. Um, there are counties that end up with no appeals that had 2,000 people come and ask why their taxes went up. So it's just kind of a variety, but I haven't gone back in yet from all the data that we got last week to actually give you that count. Last year, I think you had asked us formally to provide that information by September 1st. And if you'd like, I'll just go ahead and add it all back up. And one of the other questions was how many people win? How many taxpayers are able to prevail? Last year, when we looked at it, it was about half and half. Um, you know, it's a, it's not a, it's a difficult burden to overcome for a taxpayer because, because it's a complicated and it's a complicated system, and it's mass appraisal. It's not an individual appraisal. It's about characteristics and making sure the assessors have the right characteristics. But last year, I think about half the people that filed an appeal that got to the board of equalization, half of them probably prevailed. Um, and I'll have those numbers for last, you know, for this year, if we finish that county. Um, uh, the other question you had was, you know, I think it came up was the statements of consideration. And a couple of years ago, we tightened up the statements of consideration and the process for getting it done. It's still, it's still difficult. And I think at some point, you probably, I think you probably can find a way to keep some of the information people really don't want to know is that they sold it to their brother or something like that. But I think the sales price is what is such a difficult hindrance in all of this. So maybe at the down the road, you really need to look at a statement of consideration and find out what information can be public on there. And, and uh, most states, I think, now have their sales public. So, and I, and once again, Zillow, <laughs> because once you go and put it on realtor.com or Zillow or some other site, your neighbors kind of know what you were asking for it. So it's not the deep secret that it used to be 40 years ago. Um, again, we have uh, one other thing I think came up yesterday was the discussion of intangible personal property taxes. It's kind of just my list of yesterday. About 2005, I chaired the committee that did the intangible personal property tax study. And I think Josh, somewhere in your archives is the intangible personal property tax study. And it'll give you a pretty good summary of when we started looking, I mean, think about that, that's 15 years ago, a lot's changed in what is fungible and infungible and, and, you know, and all of that since then. So I have always thought that anything that we do as a legislature, you, you should always come back and make sure you're current every 10 or 15 years because quite a significant amount of things change. So I think that was all the questions you guys sort of had yesterday that are within our purview. Um, that's the summary of why Sheridan County is perfect and uh, what the assessed valuation is. Uh, the last thing would be on page two of the report that I gave you, which really kind of just goes through everything the Board of Equalization does. Last year, we had a bill, Senate File 39, that was clarifying what the practice before the board is with a 
uh, contested case hearing. We have two kinds of hearings. One is the appeal from the local county board where we're restricted to the record that the local county board creates. And we review that record and make sure that the county board itself wasn't arbitrary, capricious, or with, without, you know, with, not within the confines of the law. We look at all of that, and if they're okay, we, uh, you know, we, we go with the county board's decision. A lot of the county board decisions are sent back because the county boards themselves made the mistake. Not so much that either taxpayer did, but that the county board did and their procedural. And then the, uh, the other flaw in this plan, I think, is that the county board's decisions are you, any, either party, the assessor or the, or the petitioner can appeal to us for review. But if the county assessor loses, she's, we're done. And I think that's a flaw because sometimes these are really questions of law that you would probably want a district court to look at. And right now, the assessor has no right to appeal to the district court. And I think that's something that you really should look at down the road. Um, the other one was Senate File 39 itself, which was when we do a contested case hearing, we operate under the same precepts that the district court does or any other court. We take evidence, we are a trier of fact. We have, you know, we listen to the parties. If you two are sitting there and you're both arguing, over section Romanet three in a statute, but you forgot to look at, at Romanet one or section A or further up the statute to look at it in its entirety. We were told by the Supreme Court that we didn't have the authority to ask you to both tell us why you're not looking at the whole statute. And we need to get that clarified because it what it causes is that often a taxpayer appeals, they didn't appeal on that issue, that issue didn't get brought before them, they didn't get, both sides didn't get a chance to brief it, to tell us why, you know, we should look at the whole statute. This is very simple. Um, but it, we basically rule one way or the other, it goes to the Supreme Court, they rule one way or the other, and the next year the taxpayer has to do it over again. Because the either the departments figured out that they needed to ask the question we asked or the taxpayers figured out we need to ask the question we asked. So I think this is really as much as anything about a facilitation of ease for taxpayers and for the department and the state of Wyoming. When we split, we, meaning me, split the Department of Revenue and the Board of Equalization in 1995, I think I've told you all this story. I sat in my living room and cut up the statutes, copied them, cut them up, and put them in piles and said the Department of Revenue should do this and the Department of, and the Board of Equalization should do this. And Mark Quiner and I pieced it all back together. And part of what we didn't piece back together probably properly was we left the equalization process and the and the, the uh, trier of fact, the regular appeal from the Department of Revenue in the state to, too closely integrated. And so when the Supreme Court looked at it, they said that we didn't give, the, the legislature didn't give the Board of Equalization the full authority under both the, the appeal process for the uh, state property and the uh, equalization process. So it's kind of explained right here what it created. And it's certainly up to you, but I think honestly, from my perspective, and I'm the layman on the board who I like to say all the time, I'm there to say, why would we do that? Because then the lawyers tell me why, and I eventually agree with them probably, but at least I am there to say, why would we do that? And in this case, I would say, why would we make any taxpayer come to this board two years in a row, just because they didn't get the right question before the board? We're not trying to weigh the scales for either side. Both sides get to answer that question. We're simply saying, make sure you've got the right question when you come to us. So I know that was more than five minutes. I was trying. Um, and I'll answer any questions. Thank you, Ms. Mockler. Um, Senator Ide. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for being here, Mrs. Mockler. I have constituents ask me from time to time, you know, who is the State Board of Equalization? Who's the boogeyman out there that has, you know, all of the authority to make decisions on my property taxes. Um, can you just give us a little uh, structure of the State Board of Equalization? I see there's three people on here. Is that the State Board of Equalization? Is there just three people with a few staff? And are you all appointed by the governor? Or can you explain that to me? Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, Senator, the State Board of Equalization is the state of Wyoming's oldest state agency. It was created in 1869 before we became a state. At that point in time, it was the state auditor, the secretary of state, and the governor, and it ran every state agency. 
all of the state agencies ran under the state board of equalization over time it's as the state grew the board of equalization gave up a lot of those responsibilities and the governor the auditor and the treasurer ended up with more things to do so they started appointing the actual the members of the state board um the first members of the state board were former governors secretary of states and auditors it's a but that's kind of they, they've moved away from that um uh so right now what you have is a state board that is three members who are appointed by the governor to six-year terms and they're staggered terms so that the board has you know some continuity uh for the for the most part the board members are two attorneys and it's a political split first um but this the other thing that's been unique about the board is it's got two attorneys and one non-attorney in the past the non-attorney had an attorney staff member who helped write the decisions and do the research because that person isn't an attorney uh during all the all the cuts that the state had we lost both our executive assistant who coordinated all our cases and then we lost our attorney and so now I don't have an attorney supporting me but um and in addition the taxpayers don't have an attorney interpreting what's going on but the state board is three people that are on the board itself and then two staff people one is an administrative assistant and the other is the uh, statistician who does the equalization component the administrative assistant is who if you are a taxpayer you are going to call the state board you will talk to her and if you have a question, she will say, I will get back to you. She will come back to the board as an entire board, ask them, what should I do? And we will give her an idea of what to tell that taxpayer. She'll call that taxpayer back and she'll give them the answer that the board told her to give them as long as it's not legal advice. And so I think that by losing our, our board attorney, we've maybe not done the taxpayers a service, but we did cut one person out of our staff. But it is a, it's a pretty small agency and it has significant authority, especially in the equalization side. If we look at these abstracts after five years, we've sent orders and we can't do anything, you know, we can't get that assessor to do anything. The board has the authority to go back to that county and equalize. And if the board ever has to walk in and equalize, I think they mentioned this yesterday, it's called the nuclear option because no taxpayer can appeal a board of equalization's equalization decision. And that's simply to give finality to that year's taxes. Um, the board also has the ability to levy taxes. Um, I think every member of the board that I've ever known said, yeah, well, we're not doing that without a governor's permission because that'd be our last day on the board. But we have, when we were broke a few years ago, we were trying to find money and every agency was tasked with it. There are five mills that the State Board of Equalization can implement. And I think Governor Mead, you know, we wrote up exactly how it would happen and what it would be used for, because if it's intended that if the state is broke, that the State Board of Equalization will implement mill levies and it's to cover the, the debt, it's to cover the state institutions, it's to cover just the general obligations of the general fund that if you can't meet them otherwise and you know, you're in the middle. And remember, you didn't use to meet every year. So there was a two year period that that's why the board had that actual additional mill levy authority. So it's it used to be and I think it still is a, a very powerful board in the sense that it has some finality to the taxpayers of the state of Wyoming, especially with the values of their property as the as the component that works with the hearing process, we are appealable to the district court and to the the Supreme Court. So we're not the final arbitrator of, of disputes. I hope that kind of gave you a real quick. Okay, any other questions? Uh, Representative Baird. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, I, and thank you for being here. I do appreciate answering those questions from yesterday. Many of those were mine, uh, Ms. Mockler, but um, I find it interesting this request for the ability to go outside of the case that's been presented to you by the by the previous board and uh, I find it interesting because you're really kind of the judge as well as the advocate for the taxpayer at the same time is that an accurate ass assessment of the situation and if so could restrictions be put on this ability to go outside and use the information at your disposal on behalf of the taxpayer but yet not on behalf of the other party Mr. Chairman um, I don't think, I think, you know, and, and again, well, this is why I'm not a lawyer. <laughs> um, 
that's not what we're doing. We're saying that when two parties come to us with a dispute and they have to present their case, they have to get their evidence in, they brief their, everything is exactly, should operate exactly the same way it would in district court when they're doing a trial. And in district court, when they have an issue that, you know, they say to the tax, to the people, why didn't you bring this up? You know, this should be brought up. This is what the statute says. You're just reading this little tiny piece over here. We're not weighting the scales either for either to either party. We're simply saying you both missed that you're under this statute right here. You're just talking about this little piece. And I think the case that's referenced is Solvay. And I know you all know that this, the taxing of Trona has a Trona factor. It says that in, in lieu of going through a lot of other things, we created an, a specific amount of, of a percentage of the production and tax it. And within that, they were looking for exemptions. And so they came in and said, well, this is outside the Trona factor. And we said, explain to us how anything is outside of the Trona factor. That was the deal you made with the state. And so we asked both parties to tell us why is this outside the scope of the Trona factor? It doesn't anywhere in there say that you get to have this ex exemption. And so it, we ruled and said you didn't get the exemption. The taxpayer went to the Supreme, to the district court, and then the Supreme Court got it and said, "Yeah, well, you're, the the board statutes aren't that broad." And I think what we're saying is that if you want to do a real service for your taxpayers, you'll let us make sure that we're not weighting the scales, but that we're getting to the issue that really is the the crux of what the dispute was. Senator French. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I know it's late, so I'll try to be quick here. That's okay. We're missing the storms in KC, so. Oh, uh, well, I'm heading that way. <laughs> um, um, when I was county commissioner for 18 years, we were uh, set of the county board of equalization many, many, many times. I hated it because we were, uh, the county attorney represented the assessor and when we, <laughs> in 2001, we were, the, the commissioners, we were judge and jury, right? The, the person that was appealing their taxes, uh, they appealed it to us and the assessor did his information. So we were judge and jury and it was, wow. Um, so what we finally did was started recording all the, the, the process. And then we hired an attorney, our own attorney, to help us and then write the findings of facts and conclusions of law or whatever it's called, uh, which really helped us out. So just, just a little info there. Mr. Chairman, a few years ago, you all tasked the board with writing rules for the department for the county boards of equalization and the practice that they would use when a taxpayer comes before them. And they are Wyoming Administrative Procedures Act. They they you know they're pretty extensive. Actually, they're in a lot of ways a little bit more in line with what I was just talking about than are the board's ability with when we look at a at a appeal from the state department of revenue but in your case we also i think the legislature made it clear that you can hire the county board can hire a hearing officer to to run the hearing now and they can hire their own attorney or they can use the county attorney but then the assessor uses a different attorney and if they're both out of the attorney office of the county attorney they put up a little chinese wall and don't talk to each other in natrona county they are now hiring an out of the assessor is hired a, a local law firm to be her attorney so that there is no conflict with the board. But we have written pretty decent and extensive rules on how those will operate to solve a lot of the problems that probably you had when you were a county board member. Okay, any further questions? Yeah, Mr. Chairman. Chairman? Uh, Senator Mocker, uh, director. Board member. Board member. <laughs> how many years did you serve in the Wyoming Senate? Um, four in the House and 12 in the Senate. Wow. All on the Revenue Committee. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> Say that again. Uh, <laughs> I served 16 years on the Revenue Committee and eight years on appropriations. Wow. Wow. Appreciate your service. Appreciate your service in this role, too. And I just wanted to uh, ask a, again, we're kind of, the Chairman and I are getting in our work our workflow kind of ready over these next few months for this October meeting and that Cinephile 39, you know, it 
passed 31-0 out of the Senate, 9-0 out of House Revenue, and then it took kind of a twist on the floor of the House. And a lot of times you can't stop that thing, and it went down. But I mean, would that be it'd be helpful, I think, if we could bring that again? I mean, we're trying to look with you right. and the Department of Revenue if there's some just little statue, you know, fixes that can make the system operate a little better that we could probably pass in a budget session and get over the uh, the two thirds introductory requirement. That would happen in like 1975. Certainly wasn't in our original constitution. But anyway, I won't get into that again. Well, I, I can tell you, I was but, a page in the legislature year they switched that. Wow. So, <laughs> so, so anyway, that would be helpful. I would guess is that you're. Do you agree with that or would you? No, Mr. Chairman, another? I think it would be. And I think I think what got lost in there is that this was more just to make the fair the process fair to both parties and to the state. And honestly, to let me to make sure that what you were having was a process that was a little bit more transparent. And so I as I said, when we split the board up, I think that was just something that was a remnant that didn't get pulled over and separating out the appeal process and the uh hearing process from the equalization process. Very good. Any further questions? Thank you for that. Thank that you, Mr. Good. Chairman. Yeah, we appreciate yeah, you. Thanks. And uh, I guess we'll take public comment again, uh, open for public comment on the tax administration issues. Anybody heard something from the board that they want to talk about? Clarissa, anybody on Zoom? Okie dokie. We'll close that out. Uh, next up is state lands, suggested reforms and previous efforts. Wyoming Office of State Lands and Investments. Mr. Crowder, Deputy Director, making his way up. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, Mr. Chairman. I'm Jason Crowder, Deputy Director for the Office of State Lands and Investments. Appreciate this opportunity to speak to you and, and really try to answer any questions or, or help the committee in any direction they'd like to go. Uh, what we were asked to do was come with some past efforts for revenue generation on state lands and um, possible remedies to uh, shortcomings in those efforts. And, and I'm happy to do that and understanding the timing and, and I'm your last thing before you go home. I'll just jump right into that. Uh, I picked a few bills uh, that we have worked on with um, committee chairmen of the past of this committee and others um, to highlight. Uh, most specifically, we're, we're talking about revenue generation from commercial and, and residential development on state trust lands. That seems to be where a lot of the obstacles lie. Um, we have great statutes that allow us to do easements, to do grazing, to do all of those other things. But when we start talking about where revenue in this time, uh, this period in, in in the last century is leading us to start normalizing the revenue trends from state land. We're starting to look at commercial development and we're starting to look at, at residential development. The first one I'll highlight was back in 2021. Uh, we worked on House Bill 242. Uh, that bill tried to change the maximum length of a special use lease, which is where we do our commercial leasing from 75 years to 99 years. It added the word residential to the types of uses, um, including commercial. And it gave a limitation on how that residential development could occur. Uh, obviously, that didn't pass out of committee, uh, but it was a good first step to start the conversation on how and, and what we should start paying attention to when we look at commercial and residential development of state lands. The second um, that I'll highlight is in 2023, we had a bill draft um, and never made it uh, out of committee, but it was to grant the Department of State Parks management authority over certain and specific lands uh, managed by the Board of Land Commissioners for recreational opportunities. Uh, the case example that we used was a parcel outside of Lander. We affectionately call that the bus. Uh, it has a lot of recreational components to it. A lot of people in Lander utilize that parcel for hiking, for mountain biking, and sometimes they, they take their motorbikes out there. But we also have a grazing lease on that parcel. The recreational use right now is, is run unmanaged. Uh, the BLM attempts to help us, the Game and Fish attempts to help us, as well as the local sheriff's department. But those two are coming into conflict. Um, obviously, the grazing users are paying for that right to be out there and, and to use it, and the recreational users are doing it at the board's privilege uh, to be out there for free. 
what we thought was we could have a, a group come in and that would be the state park department and they could manage the recreational use of that property, develop it, enhance it, uh, make it a, a much more of a destination site, as well as pay a lease fee back to the Board of Land Commissioners so it could be a revenue generating thing. Um, that bill died, um, didn't come out of committee, obviously, uh, because I think there was some thought that this type of a, a relationship with state parks might get um, some legs and move across the whole state. Uh, we're not anticipating that. This is really trying to get us another management tool in our toolbox, as well as add that revenue stream uh, back to the beneficiaries. But we simply don't have the ability to manage that type of intense what we call overloving recreation on a parcel of state land, even with all the other partners that we're trying to leverage their efforts on. Um, so it, it seems to be a, a positive win-win on, on all sides and something we can certainly look um, at, at exploring again sometime in the future. The next is House Bill 114, which was uh, in 2023 as well earlier this year. It did a lot of what House Bill 242 attempted to do. It moved um, the maximum length of a commercial lease from 75 years to 99 years, added the word residential. Um, it also added uh, or tried to clarify how construction and development of, of buildings would be done on state lands. Right now in state statute, there are great statutes that talk about how to build private buildings on private land. There's great statutes on how to build state buildings on state land but the statutes are silent on how to build private buildings on state land. And we ran into this issue in Teton County and we'll get into that in, in just a minute, but it's a little bit unclear on when developers are looking to build those buildings, what building codes they are to adhere to when they're doing it on state lands. Obviously we want to have a building that's safe, um, that can stand the test of time, won't blow over in the wind or fall over in the snow um, and won't burn down. But we also want something that uh, will generate revenue. And sometimes um, the developers really don't know which form of regulatory environment to, to follow? Do they do what the county uh, planning and zoning departments require? Do they do something that the fire marshal's office require? And who do they go to for that permitting? So this bill attempted to clarify that in some way. It also broadened the recreational um, definition uh, to anything that the board would determine to be recreational that it could lease in a commercial way for that. Mr. Chairman, I'm going to get back to my notes. One of the key things that that bill did was also define how improvements could be compensated for when a piece of property is sold. Uh, right now, in an agricultural and grazing sense, uh, an individual who leases the property can erect a fence, can put up a windmill and a stock tank. And if they were to lose that lease for whatever reason, if we were to sell the land or if they um, lost it in a competitive scenario, uh, they could be compensated uh, that improvement's current market value is how the definition reads. And that has everything to do with its replacement value. You take into consideration its age, um, its condition and things like that. But when we're talking about commercial development, and sometimes we're talking about the actual intent of the lease is to sell that improvement and sell the land with it. If you think of a residential subdivision, you might sell lots at a time. That same improvement compensation structure is existing there. And we run into a restriction or a, a roadblock of developers wanting to use our land for that purpose when they know the only compensation they're going to get out of that house is its replacement cost. Um, so what this bill attempted to do was allow them to be compensated for that improvement that they built. Couldn't just be a house. It could be curb and gutter. It could be power and, and other things, um, but get compensated on that improvement's market value um, as if it was just offered on the open market, not any um, definition or, or restriction back to its current or, or replacement value. And the next bill, Mr. Chairman, I, I would highlight is House Bill 287. Uh, that was a bill that would create gaming districts on specific state trust lands across the state. Uh, we saw that as a positive from a revenue generation uh, standpoint. What we do in our office and the whole reason we're talking about commercial development is we are subject to the whims of the oil and gas industry specifically on how our office performs as far as revenue generation goes. When we have great um, prices for oil and gas, we have great revenue returns back to our beneficiaries. When those goes down, we, we have the same impact. 
And so what we try to do is normalize those revenue streams as much as possible. Um, commercial development is one, and one part of that commercial development could be the addition of a gaming district, which would allow certain types of revenue streams that we're currently not uh, able to utilize um, as beneficial going forward. Uh, obviously, that bill didn't, didn't make it out either. In 2020, uh, this is a good one to talk about, House Bill 162 directed our office to do a study of uh, commercial development opportunities in Teton County. Um, that is an effort that is continuing to um, evolve and, and we're continuing to work on. It's a favor the legislature gave our office that will forever be thankful for um, trying to work these issues out in Teton County. So we appreciate that. Uh, we have done that study. There were a lot of opportunities that came through that effort and, and we're continuing down those roads. The first priority for us is was to look at um, uh, enhancing the existing industrial use on the Highway 390 parcel. As you may be aware, we went through a, a solicitation to generate more interest in that to try to get more uses and, and ensure that they were paying market rates. We've issued those temporary use permits. Some of those are operating. Some of those are going through regulatory hurdles as well. Uh, but that was the first place we concentrated as a result of that bill. The next place we'll concentrate will be um, a parcel that we know as Munger Mountain. Um, it has a lot of commercial potential as well. Fantastic views, obviously. And then anything else in Teton County that might come up, uh, we can start working with that. Uh, through that effort, though, uh, we have done a lot of work to understand uh, how far the county's jurisdiction goes as far as development of those uh, development of uh, buildings or the construction codes that everybody needs to adhere to, uh, still working through that effort and working with the local jurisdiction, specifically the county commissioners, to ensure that what we're doing has some um, um, adherence to what they'd like to see as far as development or planning and zoning activities that they have underway. Uh, we want to make sure we're working hand in glove. Uh, we also want to make sure we're uh, maximizing those assets and, and having them perform to their optimal um, uh, position as well. So sometimes we might be out of step with each other, but we sure want to know where we're out of step. So we did uh, promise the county commissioners that we wouldn't take any more steps in Teton County until we held uh, two meetings, two public hearings, one with the public and, and with the neighbors around those affected um, uh, parcels, and then two with the county commissioners themselves and their planning and zoning department. We haven't been able to hold those meetings yet, so we're um, uh, still not moving forward with anything but the industrial TUPs that I spoke about earlier. Mr. Chairman, those are all of the past bills that, that come to my mind. Um, the other uh, uh, point to the topic that we're speaking under was suggested reforms. I think continuing those efforts of trying to entice commercial developers to state trust lands is something that we'd like to see moving forward. Um, it's important to note that we did appear in front of the uh, management uh, audit committee last week and talked a lot about these exact same topics and that they're starting to look into these areas as well. So we're providing them as much information as possible. Uh, but we do realize that if we can extend um, the maximum commercial uh, lease from 75 years to 99 years, that we might be opening doors to opportunities we don't currently realize. And that comes from a funding perspective, their funding uh, perspective when, when coming to develop on our lands. Uh, the next would be to clarify this. How does a individual construct a building on state trust lands and what um, guidance do they follow? County guidance, state guidance, fire, fire marshal's office and the like. Um, and then uh, Adding this is clarification of improvement compensation, ensuring that if we do uh, a residential lease or, or something where the intent is to sell that improvement, that they can receive that market value and really open that door for folks to come and utilize us. We've had a lot of conversations about state trust land and being uh, part of a solution for a community and then us deriving some revenue stream from that. Uh, we've had a lot of conversations about affordable housing in that area. and. It, it's, it's important to note that when we think about the statutes as currently written, we're also thinking about the land as currently owned. Uh, there may be a situation where we can barter and trade land ownership to help a local community in the affordable housing sense, but we won't be able to with these existing uh, uh, statutory structure. Um, if we were to trade land, we're still under the same restriction of a developer not being able to be justly compensated for the improvement that they put on the property. 
the next, uh, and it's something that the legislature has helped us with over the last year, is to simply get the word out that state trust land um, is there for the benefit of the beneficiaries and that our office works as the fiduciary for that um, effort. Uh, we're not open space. We're not just a, the view shed that everybody should look at, but we're there to be utilized um, in an appropriate and responsible manner. But we need to get that word out because I don't know that a lot of folks who are looking to develop in the state of Wyoming understand that the blue squares, blue squares are available for use. Uh, so the legislature helped us with that. Uh, we got a, a, a public information officer approved. Uh, we've yet to hire that, but along with that came an advertising budget so we can start getting some outreach into those uh, um, markets where, where folks are looking for land to develop and, and we can show them that the state of Wyoming, its state trust lands are available for consideration uh, with that. Uh, one of the other things that we talked about with the management audit committee last week was that perhaps some clear clarity from the legislature would be nice. Um, is it that the intent that these lands could be utilized for commercial development, or is it that the simply doesn't want it? Uh, we want to have the status quo. We want to just utilize the lands that we as we always have, and that would help us provide help provide direction to us on where to actually deploy resources and, and be responsive to certain types of, of opportunities that come up, whatever they might be. And then finally, Mr. Chairman, as far as remedies, I, I think we say this every time we're in front of a committee and it's probably the same for every state agency is staffing is a real limitation for us. Uh, we have one individual that manages our whole commercial leasing program. He currently manages 500 active special use leases that are all um, could be ancillary oil and gas leases, could be recreation. Uh, but each one of those 500 leases takes daily attention. Uh, we review those rent structures for each one of those leases once every five years. So we're looking at 100 new rent structures um, every year, doing whatever day-to-day -day management comes along with that, as well as pulling in 30 to 40 new leases each year and doing the required and analysis and, a, and appraisal of each one of those. The guy's taxed. He also does all of our wind leasing. He does, um, we're looking at some solar leasing opportunities coming forward, which would be brand new for us. Uh, but he is in charge of all that, uh, carbon capture leasing. One guy does all of that, which means he's not out looking for opportunities to develop new revenue generating streams. We have a couple of parcels identified across the state that do deserve attention that are um, underutilized. Uh, one is in Natrona County. We have more in Teton County um, around Cheyenne. Uh, we simply just don't have the capacity to be able to manage the day-to-day -day, as well as look for new revenue generating opportunities. So we're going to keep working with the legislature to create that um, a team, if you will, to, to add people, to add authority, to, to add ladders in there so that we can have the day-to-day -day figured out as well as looking at new and, and varied opportunities. Um, Mr. Chairman, I believe that's that's everything that I had prepared and I'm happy to answer any questions in this area. All right. Well, thank you. Uh, looks like Senator McEwen, you have a question. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I guess my first question is, and it's two questions. One is, do we have the ability to just sell the land? And my second question is, if we do have the ability to sell the land, why wouldn't we sell it? And why are we as a state government getting into leasing businesses and all kinds of things? It seems outside our purview. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, and I'll add to that because that kind of dovetails with my question was, um, and I can package our together so we don't take up more time, would be, you know, you when you mentioned permanent structures on state land, that kind of, I came to the same conclusion putting a permanent structure, a commercial building on a piece of a state section, why not just, especially in Teton County, why not where property values are through the roof? Why not just sell it and then collect the property tax revenue off of that and the sales price? And then that the property tax would be an ongoing revenue stream because obviously we don't tax state land. So sure. Package those two questions together. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. It, it's important to note that the revenue derived in our office and from these lands goes directly to the beneficiaries. As one of those beneficiaries could be the general fund, but it's extremely small. 86% of our revenue goes back to the uh, 
a common school fund, uh, the K through 12 school system. So when we start looking at revenue, we're not um, looking at sales tax along with lease fees. We're just looking at the lease fees. Uh, yes, we can sell state land. Uh, the constitution requires that that be done at public auction um, and that it does so in a way that the proceeds from that sale can protect the state from inflationary pressures. So we have that opportunity. I believe it was um, 2005, and I can go back and check the date on that, but the legislature gave us guidance that said that trust land needs to remain a substantial component of the state's total investment portfolio. Uh, so at that time, it looked back at a baseline of 1999 at a total acreage owned, and it told us not to move above or below a 10,000 acre threshold. And we keep track of that. And that was a budget footnote. So the authority for it is expired, but the Board of Land Commissioners pays attention to it. So it's actually the legislature who told us that we needed to keep these lands in ownership and maintain that baseline within that 10,000 acre right. threshold. And from our perspective, I think that makes a lot of um, fiduciary sense. Uh, obviously, land is the best hedge against inflation in the long term. Um, selling it and investing it has a lot of uh, inherent risks, of in return re risks that simply owning the land doesn't bring. And you're absolutely correct. The appreciation is part of that investment structure, is part of that um, income tree that we need to pay attention to. So when we do look at selling a piece of land, it's not that and, uh, somebody comes in with an application and requests us to sell it, then we move directly to selling it. We get an application in and we analyze what is the best use of, of that investment. Is it selling it and putting the funds in the treasurer's office for him to, to invest? Or is it um, to keep it and to further lease it going forward? And so we do that economic analysis on every single one. However, the, the constitutional requirement for it to be sold at public auction uh, really limits the amount of applicants we have in coming to take advantage of that. Co-chairman Harshman has. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman and uh, Mr. Crowder. Just maybe for the committee's uh, uh, view of this, just how many acres were we granted at statehood of trust lands? Mr. Chairman, we were granted approximately 4.2 million acres, surface and subsurface estate. And then how many do we have now out of the 4.2 million? Mr. Chairman, we have 3.9 subsurface estate and 3.4 surface estate. So we sold about 800,000 surface estate acres over over our uh, statehood so i think uh, and you know some of those you know there's some horror stories um you know and i think what you said land is the best hedge of inflation and particularly why it was granted why our you know was granted to us at statehood was to for these permanent um responsibilities of the state some of these trust lands are for game and fish some of them are for the state hospital, the state miners hospital, universities, schools are the biggest portion. But I think uh, uh, so that I guess that's the the piece of this thing is that, you know, we have this trust fiduciary responsibility to manage these for a high return. And I think that's where the legislature, because it's going to keep our taxes lower. This is a huge investment and the more we can get a return from it. And we, we frankly have some of these trust lands in Teton County are the most valuable parcels in the world. And, you know, uh, and I just want to talk a bit about Teton County and I know a good representative from there can certainly add more, but, um, you know, there was a parcel sold for a few million bucks, you know, a couple administrations ago and uh, it's turned into i don't know half a billion dollar property now and and all that is really you know that's but i think uh there's there's maybe a move i've heard because bad news travels a fast horse sometimes but i uh that maybe the kelly parcel there's a movement to maybe uh offer an appraised value on really a priceless piece of ground you know and we sold some of Yellowstone, some of Teton a few years back for 44 million. And I think what this appraised by I'm hearing, it's, you know, it's under a hundred million is what I'm hearing. I don't know if that's true. And I don't, I'm not even asking you to comment because you couldn't comment on it anyway, but I'm just saying it's priceless. And even if we're getting an $1,800 grazing 
fee on it. The land is still appreciated. And uh, and I know the community of Jackson just bought five acres for $28 million. Um, that's a pretty good starting price, you know, and you got a mile wide block of land and the, the most scenic land in the world, most, you know, priceless. So I just want to, you mentioned that the legislature had mentioned to you about that threshold. And I'm, I'm glad that our predecessors did that. And I think there's a group of us are still like that. It's an incredible gift, uh, makes our state incredibly unique. And I think the way we operate them, I never hear from my friends in oil and gas that they have problems with state lands getting leases. It's always the federal lands issue. And so I commend you on that. I think in the one person that you got working that is must be doing a great job because I I hear nothing but compliments. So I appreciate all that work that's going in that. But I think all of us and the vast majority of them are going to be grazing leases and they're going to remain grazing leases for centuries. And that's a good thing. But there are some right on the interstate. They're incredibly valuable. There are some right next to your towns that could be leased out for to build some properties on for affordable housing and Teton and some of these places where you can't and and Cody and Powell. Uh, so I think there's some opportunities we got to just kind of as a revenue committee where we can generate revenue without raising any taxes and really uh, and that's where I kind of, you know, my time on the, the appropriations committee and you go through all this and you, you're trying to find these kind of things to take advantage of what we're really, what we're really blessed with. And um, so Appreciate your work and your service in this area. And I just want us to, boy, we don't want to give away any land in the park. Man, the federal government doesn't need any more land in the park. And I will just say that I, I know there's a lawsuit going on about this issue of who controls state lands, the state or the county, as far as building codes. And I won't ask you to comment on that because you can't comment on that. But I, I heard that the Park Service just built a new big building in the park in Grand Tita. And I don't think they consulted with the county commissioners or did any planning or zoning. They just built a nice big building. And uh, so I think, you know, this whole thing, how we do this, um, uh, I guess I just want to say to you as much saying, I don't really even have a question, appreciate your efforts and know that we're going to keep trying to support and move this issue forward in this legislative process that takes time and we'll just keep working it. So I appreciate all your work and appreciate you coming up here today, sharing with us. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Senator Ide. <clears throat> Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks for being here. Deputy Director, I see you a lot, Ag Committee. Um, you know that you mentioned 1999, I guess is when the, the, the constitution was changed. No net gain, no net loss. Try to keep that balance the same. Um, is there any, you know, on, on especially Teton County, that's maybe the focus on needing housing. Uh, and if there's state lands, you know, close there it, it, to keep you out of the commercial real estate leasing business, can you guys look at that no net gain, no net loss and trade that for another parcel of ground that is equally scenic and valuable and maybe work the deal that way is that something you guys look at a lot of times on this commercial residential opportunity thank you mr chairman mr chairman absolutely and and we do that every day and and perhaps i misspoke earlier uh, so in 2005 the legislature put in a budget footnote that it didn't want um, us to go above or below a certain baseline that baseline was derived in 1999 um, of that many acres uh, currently, we are 3,300 acres under that baseline, and that changes with every single transaction we do. Uh, not every single transaction, uh, when we do an exchange, is an acre for acre. Uh, we do it on a value for value basis, and so those acre discrepancies have created what we have as a 3,300 below that baseline situation. But you're absolutely correct. If we were um, approached with a scenario where um, 
something in Teton County, for example, were to become private and then could be utilized for affordable housing, we would look in an exchange scenario for something of equal value. And we've done that uh, with Teton National Park. Uh, when we looked at the Kelly parcel and the Antelope Flats parcel, the federal government was having a hard time coming up with the full value of both of those. And so we started exploring the exchange idea. Uh, when you're looking at an exchange, you're not necessarily going to get land in Teton County. Not a lot of folks are going to give us that land. So we had to look outside of the county. And when you look outside the county, the acres grow dramatically. And it was very hard to put an exchange of, in a value for value sense together in that way. Uh, but Senator, I, you're, you're exactly correct. And we do that every day. And that, that's what we want to find is that value for value scenario. Um, not only to, to utilize the, the no net gain of, of acreage to our advantage, but also increase the amount of revenue and those revenue streams coming back to the beneficiaries off of that exchange as well to make that asset actually perform to its optimal level. Oh, yes, Representative Byron. Thank you, Chairman. Deputy Director Crowder, thanks for being here and thanks for the update today. You know, I think it's important for the committee to know that um, as we speak about the lands in Teton County, um, you know, millions and millions of dollars have been left on the table that could potentially be going to the beneficiary and not including sale at all, you know, just, just going off of private philanthropy. Um, you mentioned Munger Mountain, you know, as a potential development place, you know, I think it's um, somewhat sensitive in the middle of my district. We're talking about a, a parcel that, you know, I killed my first elk on. So I think it's important to, uh, for the committee to know what are your boundaries, what, what, what's holding you back in being able to work with those local communities to tap into these, these millions of dollars that, that are, they are willing to, to contribute to, to the, to the children, as we always say, and, uh, and, and what can we do in your opinion to, uh, to help you, whether or not it's bill drafting or um, I guess policy change to make it easier for your office. Obviously you mentioned staffing already once, um, but you know, I, I think it's really important um, that, that, uh, that, that we kind of can direct that discussion and, and, and help you tap into these, these dollars that ultimately is what we're after. Mr. Crowder. Mr. Chairman, Representative Byron, and, and thanks for that question, because that's a, a great one. Every single parcel that the state owns has its own unique attributes that could be utilized for a benefit um, that could be sitting there and, and appreciating over time. It could be direct utilization. So you're exactly right. Every single parcel needs its attention to try to get it to, to, be, um, to return its optimal um, performance back to the beneficiaries. The statutory um, uh, changes that I've suggested that that kind of open more doors to allow more opportunities to come in that we can analyze to figure out which best suits that particular parcel uh, would be extremely beneficial in, in what you're talking about. When we're limited to one use case on every single parcel across the state, you really limit the, the benefit that goes back to the beneficiaries and then the local benefit that that parcel might provide to somebody who wants to shoot their first elk. So we wanna make sure that that opportunity is, is as open as possible, um, but also in specific to Teton County and Munger Mountain, having that local meeting, having that town hall with everybody there um, who is interested in it, who would like to use it for a variety of different reasons and listening to them uh, tell us what they think would be best and understanding that what they may bring us are a lot of uses that may not return any revenue and that needs to be considered and analyzed. But there may be a couple that do return revenue and could be outside of the box thoughts that we've never come up with before. So we need to have that conversation with that community first uh, before we can fully answer your question. See any any more questions? You representative story, you look you look like you're ready to pound. <laughs> <laughs> You've been quiet all day. <laughs> That's true. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're um, and thank you, Mr. Crowder, for being here. I I guess I just would like to make a few observations. Um uh, to your point, having one person being able to um, manage all your commercial leases is is a recipe, frankly, for disaster when it comes to Teton County. Um, we have seen what has happened on the 390 parcel, um, and there's just a lot of miscommunication. There's a lot of challenges going on between um, concerns over uh, over the airshed, concerns over septic systems, frankly, concerns uh, this winter over 
shipping containers that were being illegally shipped over Teton Pass, jackknifing and snarling traffic for hours, all of which had to do with the leases that the state has has um, has has let under temporary use permits. As you know, my community really cares about um, these parcels, and they also understand the need to um, to make revenues from the schools for the schools. And as someone who served on a state trust land uh, task force back in the 90s, um, I, I share that concern. But I also just think that, um, you know, I, I guess I've ridden my bike by the 390 parcel for 25 years, knowing that that's the most valuable piece of property that the state owns. But if you had told me that we were going to have geodesic glamping and shipping containers there is the best way to make money for the school kids of Wyoming, I would be shocked. And I just think we can all do better. Um, I, I do think that um, the community really does want to participate in the conversation about all the state trust lands in Teton County. And, um, and I do think it's, that conversation is way overdue. Uh, we did have a hearing a couple of weeks ago that DEQ um, uh, had um, scheduled um, to talk about the septic system for the glamping uh, that needed to be reconsidered. Um, it was held on a Friday afternoon at 5.30 p.m. and uh, 80 people showed up and, and you know, we, we had a lot of good testimony there. So um, that was a lease that the lessee said that they would not let a drop of wastewater uh, into Fish Creek and that is not the plan any longer. So I do think there are better ways to go about um, making revenues off of these lands. And I, I would welcome the committee to consider either a working group or some such thing, especially to deal with the Teton County parcel since they've been singled out. So thank you. Thank you, Representative. Um, do you have, have any comments on that before I go to uh, Senator French? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, can the state trade land with BLM? Say there's a town, I know Cody's kind of hemmed in on the south side by BLM land. Um, can they trade so there'd be state land next to whatever city it is? And uh, is that possible? Mr. Garland. Mr. Chairman, uh, Senator French, absolutely. In fact, we're currently underway in exchange with the Forest Service on the Medbow National Forest to create some management flexibility in that. Uh, the place where we're limited in federal land exchanges is really the federal land requirements. Uh, they have different appraisal requirements. They have different cost sharing requirements, um, as do we, and neither party wants to pay the other's appraisal, and sometimes that's where a transaction stops. But most often, uh, when we talk about BLM lands, we're talking about cultural and habitat uh, protection type things, and they need to do uh, what they call a feasibility analysis to ensure that what they're doing is in the public's best interest as far as the protection of those um, habitat areas, those cultural resources, and even the species that utilize them. Uh, in my experience, when we start having those conversations, a lot of uh, um, traction gets lost when they don't recognize they're also acquiring land in that exchange, not just disposing of it. Um, that could carry the, some of those same uh, beneficial attributes uh, with it. Um, the cultural uh, piece is a very big thing that has caused a lot of our transactions to just lay on the table uh, because they need to go out and do an assessment of whatever could be there. And that assessment is up to them as far as how deep it goes. And, and I don't know all the levels of a cultural resource assessment, but they need to do those and they become very expensive. And along with that comes the environmental analysis, uh, all of the NEPA work. And if it raises to an EIS level, all of these things are expensive and their analysis that the state doesn't, uh, our office doesn't necessarily undergo, but we need to make sure or wait for them to get that done. And as we wait, personalities change in the federal government. The local field office um, uh, supervisors change, administrations change, the idea about a transaction start to change. And, and so a lot of things start stacking up that make a, an exchange with the federal government and specifically the BLM, they're a little harder to deal with than the Forest Service, just never reach the finish line. Any more comments or questions? For the good deputy director. Okay. Thank you, sir. Thank we you. appreciate you.
Uh, is there any public comment on the state lands issue? Anybody in the room? Senator Burns. <laughs> Welcome, sir. Thank you. Afternoon. Um, I just wanted to put some historical context. Oh, introduce yourself to the committee. Not everybody out there knows who you are. Sorry. Oh, I'm sorry. Yep. Um, my name is Bruce Burns, and I'm an ultra crepidarian. <laughs> Floor is yours, sir. Um, the question that was brought up by Senator McCown was the idea of selling off the land. I just wanted to give you some historical context to this. In 1993, exactly 30 years ago, the the director of state lands was a fellow named Howard Schreiner. And at that time, he had the power himself to decide to sell state lands. That's exactly what he did. He came up with the idea that you had mentioned and, and Mr. Chairman, that you had mentioned that it would be better to liquidate this and manage it as money. And that's exactly what they did, only they did it in a really silly manner that anybody who wanted any state land could just put a bid to the state, depending on what they thought it was. And I had never seen anything like that in my life where the buyer decides what assets he wants to buy and puts the price on it. And that's how that event that the co-chairman mentioned uh, over in, in Teton County, I believe that guy got a, a full section of Teton County and just made a killing on it. Uh, it happened here in Sheridan quite a bit too, and most of the scenic areas uh, over in Cody. Uh, and what happened was the legislature finally came in for its next session, the 94 session, and put a moratorium on the sales. And when you look at uh, the uproar that that caused at the time, and I think that's where the context comes in, if you decide that you want to do something like this, gird your loins because you're going to have a tiger by the tail. And the big issue you're going to be getting on phone calls is going to be access. Access from the citizens who want to go on state land to recreate, to hunt, and do whatever it is. And if you're, and it's going to be viewed as selling state lands to private interests and cutting out their access. So you want to do something like that, be my guest, but you better make other plans after the next election. Mayor McEwen? I, I think you might have misunderstood some of what I said. So I'm no, you, you were just mentioning the option. Well, I wasn't su chair, suggesting that chair, you were sir. that you were proposing it. If we are going to allow people to build commercial buildings uh, on the lands, why would we lease it to them instead of sell it? I'm not suggesting we sell all of the parcels. I am suggesting that we, as a government, are now going to get into a position where we zone, control, inspect what people are going to build for a commercial entity on state property. And I don't think as a state we belong in that particular business. And that was kind of my point. And I probably didn't make it very well, so I apologize. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Chairman. Mr. Burns? Mr. Chairman, uh, thank you. And, that's, and you're exactly right. And there should be uh, a number of... Uh, of uh, I guess, uh, borders put on what can be built on state land. I always thought there had been, especially with with uh, uh, grazing leases, uh, exactly what could be put on and how permanent that structure would be. Follow up. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And part of the genesis and background of the common is I used to know the owners of the Glendo Marina and they have a house built out there on state property. And as they sold the marina, it starts getting quite dicey and questionable of what happens. They can sell the house, but then you got to work out a land lease with the state again. And, and in those cases, I think if we're going to allow somebody to use it as a residence or a commercial property, we should get out of the way as a state. Mr. Burns. Well, Mr. Chairman, we're kind of getting out of the uh, the footprint of the Revenue Committee. Uh, if I was still chair of TRW, I would suggest that that house be made part of the marina complex and uh, uh, 
and they'd be reimbursed by the state. And then that house would be owned by the state and could be uh, then leased along with the other marina facilities. Uh, state parks has always had problems getting uh, operators to rent those facilities out for the summer. It's it's always been a problem because it's it's a three month business, and um, uh, that would have been my suggestion. Uh, the other thing that was asked was about trades and swaps, and just out where I live, out here by Moncrief Ridge, uh, there's a, a um, rancher named Ski Johnston. He just swapped, I think it was 2,300 acres with the state that was landlocked uh, right on the face of Moncrief Ridge for similar property over in Johnson County down by Crazy Woman and that uh, is, is completely ac accessible by the public. That's why I don't think there's ever been an uproar about it because it actually benefited the public. But as I said, I just wanted to give some historical context uh, mm. to this particular issue. It's not the sort of thing that revenue generally deals with. Mr. Burns, can I ask you, so going back to your comment about the uproar, I think what I'm sensing that we have heartburn with is, you know, if you got a beautiful piece of ground in Teton County that people recreate on, and they they see that as a public land. Now we're talking about building affordable housing on it, so they're going to lose that recreational opportunity because they're building permanent structures on a piece of state land. That's why the thought was, okay, now this is a slippery slope because the state's going to be a landlord now when on on public land. Why not? To my point, why not just sell it at that point and collect the property tax revenue? Um, that that would generate. So that's kind of where we're going. Do you see that angle of the, when you've got a beautiful piece of land that people want to recreate on, that's going to go away when you start burning, building permanent structures on state land. Cause it's, it's not a grazing lease. It's not a mineral lease. It's not open for people to go out there and hike and walk their dog and stuff like that. This is completely different. Mr. Chairman, and, and you're right. That is a completely different topic. And actually I, did not want to address that. That's a completely different problem uh, that you might have. And, um, but I would, again, be against selling it. You may want to get a higher lease because it's a higher use uh, to, to benefit the state, whether it's a school section or whatever it is. Um, but I, sh I surely would never sell any land in Teton County. I mean, I believe their property from from yesterday in the sheet that was given out, I believe Teton County's property values increased 42% last year alone. Yeah. And so how silly would, would we be to say, okay, we sold it two years ago and now it's worth 100% more than what we sold it for. Okay, thank you, sir. Any more questions for Senator Burns? Thank you, sir. Nobody wants to know my favorite color or do I think it's going to win the Super Bowl or anything? Maybe after the fact, but a lot of us have to, or a lot of these people have a long drive home. So it's, time's getting late. Yeah, but I don't. I know. A couple miles. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Okay. Any more public comment? Seeing none. Nobody on Zoom. Clarissa shaking her head no. That closes out state lands committee. Um, Mr. Co chairman, we've got a lot of work to do before next uh, committee meeting. And it sounds like we're gonna put together some working groups, divide it out on property tax, this idea, the tax administration issues, we got sales tax issues, we got the electric generation tax issues, all that's gonna be a big lift for this committee. And it's gonna take a lot of us to get our, our work done between now and then we're, we're gonna do some bill drafts because there's probably gonna be quite a few. Uh, like to hear your thoughts, Mr. Coaching. Yeah, I think uh, members, uh, I think it just, you know, everybody take a few days, catch your breath. I know some of us got other committee meetings, but I think we, then I think the chairman and I'll have a, just a talk. I mean, we do have the two thirds introductory vote. Uh, so, you know, some bills you probably just don't need to bring because it, they're going to be close issues and that take a lot you only i don't know in the house we get one minute you guys get 30 seconds or something i think <laughs> to explain it and it's pretty tough a lot of times to get those introductory votes so i don't want to put our staff through a bunch of work on a bunch of stuff that's we're going to have for one minute but um but i do think you know so like something that's complex like some of this stuff we just heard this afternoon you know uh, but anyway i think we can get together over the next few days and kind of get this workflow divided out and work with staff and 
then look for an email from us and we'll get to work on these issues. So I kind of want to yeah, take some time and get organized. I think so. Right on. Okay. Any committee comments? Any general discussion? Yes, Senator French. Uh, one thing I was want, I mentioned, I don't know when, um, today or yesterday. Um, uh, sorry, I'm getting tired. Um, <laughs> on property, personal property taxes going away after like 10 years. Would the committee be willing to allow LSO to look into that? See what the effects of uh, after five years or after 10 years, because that, that stuff's always be being replaced at a much higher value. An example, a tractor from 50 years ago, 12,000, now it's $250,000. So as those things are added at today's prices and every year, you know, it's much higher value and some of the other could drop off is kind of what I'm looking at. I was just wondering if the committee was willing to allow LSO to kind of look into that a little bit. Yeah, and get that to us by the next meeting. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. All right. Well, I'd like to thank Wyoming PBS for live streaming for us. Did a great job. Appreciate you guys. Of course, our LSO staff for all the hard work you guys put in behind the scenes and keep us moving along. General public for great, great job yesterday. I was watching and following along on Zoom and, and just um, process is working. And thank you committee for all your hard work and buckle up, we got a lot to do. So we're gonna be, we're gonna be uh, volunteering a lot of you to help us get these issues to where we need to get them for sessions. So Mr. Chairman. Okay, thanks. All right, meetings adjourned. <laughs>